Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the Lincoln Cast for the week of May the 10th, 2013. You're listening to the Giant Bomb Community's Guild Wars 2 podcast. My name's Thurbleton, and going around the table, I'm joined by Self Confessed Cynic. What's up? Hey, I'm. <laughs> I decided much, to go it, black with that. I'm sorry. Much more enjoying this new <laughs> intro music. It's very nice. Well done. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. You are so going meta because we can't hear I'm it. I'm forcing your hand. <laughs> you oh, no, it's definitely it going to be there. It's definitely going to be there. Uh, and then also around the table is Durin. How you doing? I told you A was better than B. Uh, a is not better. I don't know. It's it's hard to tell whether the A version Folks of the new intro or B is crazy. Better. New Brahma, what was your choice on A to B? I think uh, I can diagnose Duran with a new disease called musical dyslexia because <laughs> you are doing a bad job at finding good music, Duran. It is clearly B. Uh, I love how you guys are both arguing over, like, you, you had both musical theory rules on which, yep. like, your reason is better. Yep. Uh, Shimboy, how are you doing today? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spell this out for you. The reverse arpeggios in B sounded good on their own, but they didn't flow well with the rest of the piece. I, yeah, I'd, I'd exactly. somewhat agree because I did because what I did was I got the same one piece of music, and then I cut it to be a bit more energetic for a bit. We've been talking about this. What are we even doing? Know, <laughs> you cut it. You guys are arguing over like four channels of music. It's eight bit. <laughs> uh, last, last person on the podcast. Uh, actually, I think he's the one who helped create the intro music that we're using. Uh, Josh Foreman, how you doing today? Great. Nice. <laughs> Energy. That was I like it. Like the Wonderful. least informative intro for the special guest who this entire episode is devoted for. I've ever heard. Josh Foreman of ArenaNet, environment <laughs> designer. How are you doing today? Super great. There we go. Oh, okay. uh, super good choice of words. Nice. I, like I guess I want this to be as short a long podcast as possible. So we're just going to jump into the first topic. For folks, folks who don't know who are listening to this, uh, our podcast for the first time. We usually talk about what we've been playing either at the beginning or we mix it in. Yep. Uh, but we are, we're going to skip the part where all of us host talk and we're just going to find out what Josh has been playing lately. So Josh, And, I, and just to, to? before that, I will note that I will be putting in the show notes as to when we actually start talking about Guild Wars 2. Do not expect us to talk about Guild Wars 2 for like the first 30 to 45 minutes. I'm just going to put that out say, there. If the last episode is any indication. <laughs> or really, sorry, less, those are an indication. Hopefully yeah. less Hobbit talking will be... Found I, here. I won't anyway, Josh, Trek, we'll see. What you been up to? Oh, me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, games. Uh, recently, I've been going back through my collection and trying to wrap up loose ends. Like, finally got through Skyrim. Nice. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, that is an accomplishment. <laughs> I, I think I had almost 200 hours in it. I, Holy I, cow. I and this is why I will never finish that game. Yeah. Well,. I didn't have to take that long. I just never paid attention to the main quest. So well, no, actually, but I, I will. And so, <laughs> by saying that you finished it, do you mean you actually did end up going up and finishing the main quest? Or yeah, okay, yeah. Because I, having looking at our previous discussions on this podcast, you being really into environments, that game is almost endless when it comes to new environments and stuff. Holy cow! Sure, yeah, it's it's great. It's really. Uh really uh that word where you feel uh inspired that's the word yeah inspired, <laughs> inspired. Yes. what's your favorite part of talking about being oh never mind go ahead <laughs> oh my favorite part i i really like it when they do the the what they call kit bashing where they take uh, a couple different you know like the the mossy wet cave and they mix it in with the dwarven architecture or whatever um that's that's pretty fun where did that what? I've never heard that word before. Kit bashing? Oh, okay. You're so, just not in so, the industry, Sinead. Yeah, what's happening? <laughs> they're, uh, you know, all their dungeons are split up into basically like Lego chunks, right? And they could put a hallway here and a room there. And they just, so so they call those kits. So they have the, the dwarf, I forget what they call the dwarves, right? They're, they have that kit. They have the, the generic dungeon kit. They have the... Um, uh, yeah, you know the, the yeah. snow cave kit. It, it's almost like a modular design of yeah. like we can add this hallway and chunk it together. Yeah, it's it's almost some would say like the story dungeon that you probably haven't played yet, Cynic. Oh, boom! All right. <laughs> for the living story. Hey, anyway, Cynic, that's Guild Wars Two. We're gonna skip that for now. <laughs> Come back to Skyrim. Yeah, so it's it's neat to see uh, how far they can push the their modular technology and stuff. And um, yeah, it's it's fun. That is because yeah, I remember. I remember watching, like, right when they were about to release the creation kit, like, to modders, they were talking about how all of all of the dungeon environments were modular. So they just had one of the guys in, like, a short little video 
go over and go, okay, okay, we're going to take this hallway and this big like square room from these two completely different sets and you link them together and if you just maneuver it just right, it'll mesh like perfectly. So That's it's a cool. real smart way to make like environments both easy to make and the ones that are easy to make also still look really good. Nice. Mm-hmm. And it's also crazy yeah, because it. it's, it's ceaselessly um, interesting to me asking Josh what his favorite part about a game is because – when I think of Skyrim, it's like I think of that time where I was fighting a dragon on top of a keep um, and I was just like snowing and I jumped onto his back and then stabbed him in the back of the head. And Josh is like, yeah, I like like the, the blending of their modular set design. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know. That's still... are, you, are you an abuser of the development console or developer console, Josh? <laughs> Do you like to use the developer console? Do you, do you find times like, wow, this this fight is a little bit difficult. I'm going to hit dev dev and turn on god mode and then summon a bunch of dragons to my aid. That sounds pretty okay. No, I I play completely by the book. To be nice. honest, I, it, good for you. In well, developing, good in developing, good you're you. constantly doing that, and it's just not really fun. Right. Oh yeah. Play. Oh, that's how that's. I quit Skyrim and picked it up many times because I could not hold myself back from cheating. That's. <laughs> That's probably not a good indication of me. <laughs> so, so Josh, do you uh, play with mods or do you just play stock? I, you know, I have it on Xbox. So. Nice. Oh, no. Okay. Nice. <laughs> no, I, I'm actually a totally a, a stock guy because I love seeing what the developer's vision was for a game, at least my first time through it. Yeah, I think the only mods I actually use on mine were like aesthetic stuff. Like I use like a depth of field mod and things like, like uh, realistic lighting mod, things like that, but like nothing that actually directly affected gameplay because I'm going that ones- way as well. The only ones that I really use are like doesn't really change what things are, but say just like a higher res texture, yeah. um, something like yeah. outside and it's easier to read and stuff. And then, yeah, like I mean, the in retrospect, one. I think I really would have liked. Uh, I'm sure they have one. I don't know if they do, but one that al- uh, let's see doesn't alphabetize, but puts your potions in. Uh, you know, <laughs> yep. Oh, oh yes, there's, there's, there is the Sky UI mod. Sky which, UI is fantastic. Yes, it sorts it fixes everything, the UI. and it has like a search f- uh, function in your inventory. It's it's it amazing. fixes it. Let's just be clear. It fixes that terrible. No, because no, like, for, for a controller, for a controller, that UI um, is actually really yeah, nice. It's but it's unordered. It's like totally a weird way of viewing your stuff. I, I know, like navigating it is good, but getting to the stuff you want when you want it isn't exactly. A, so as, as far as other games, <laughs> yeah. uh, because you guys are out of my league now. So, <laughs> the other thing I've been doing is just, uh, I, I don't want to say research, but it's kind of like that, where I just want to see all the various new mechanics that um, kind of the smaller games out there. I, I'm loath to use the word indie, but you know, games with smaller dev teams that are focused on one particular new mechanic, like right. FTL and Fez and Super Meat Boy and Unfinished Swan, Mark of the Ninja, that kind of stuff. Have you have you played all of those already? I I, I actually just wrote that down because I saw your your question there, so I nice. wrote down all the ones I've recently been playing through. Because my question about Fez is, did you play Fez or did you play Fez? <laughs> Meaning, did you get into like all the crazy like? What does this mean? There's Nonsense. two games in Fez. Almost in like a room 237 sense of like trying to overanalyze everything about every like fr- cell of a frame of a like shot. Well, it, to be fair, um, like there are two games in Fez. There's the first time you go through, which is just like a normal platformer that's really easy. And then you realize that, holy crap, there's like a sub game and it's like all deep. Oh, yeah, stuff. okay. So I, I got to that part. I'm still playing through the, the first section of it and I enjoyed the, the meta commentary that all the little NPCs are spouting and stuff like that. But oh, yes, yeah, that's, that's, that's a also, great. That's yeah, but he hasn't gotten to Fez yet then. Yeah, he hasn't gotten <laughs> to Fez because um, Josh, um, it's, it's, it's great that I was able to at least get you in this because you may not have realized it, but I'm not sure how much you've read into Fez. But there's a particular point in Fez that if you observe the correct thing, you realize that everything you've played so far is just like the top layer of that game. And there's so much more beyond that. It's, it's, it, well, if, that's exciting. I'm glad you yeah. hear that. I hope, I hope you get into it. It's going to be awesome. And again, more or less made by just one crazy Canadian. <laughs> yeah. French Canadian, not a real Canadian, by the I'm, way. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh. I saw that indie game, the movie. And uh, yeah, he did not come off well in that. <laughs> I am not yeah, a big no, fan in, of in Phil Fish. Not a big fan of Phil Fish. <laughs> I don't know. Like is, uh, they, they had him on on Giant Bomb during. I think it was. GDC. He seems like a cool guy. And he actually seemed pretty okay there. I think. I think. Yeah. 
the, the stress yeah, and everything. I would never he say he's through. a good or bad. I'm just saying on that film, he did oh, not. Oh yeah. Well. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> For the record, Indie Game the movie is a high quality film that everyone should watch. I agree. Yeah, I'd say that. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So, of those games, uh, which the, have the, you found the, the most fun? Fun. Well, I'm most addicted to FTL. FTL. Yeah, a lot of people are addicted to FTL. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a weird thing because um, I, I, I've never got into the roguelike in the fantasy genre. I mean, fantasy is kind of my de facto go-to genre for anything, um, but I've never really liked roguelikes. And then last year, I fell in love with Spelunky, which is a roguelike platformer, and then this year, a roguelike space sim. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the deal is. It's not only a roguelike platformer, like to anybody who's listening, it's it's also really fun with just a group of people. So if you have friends at the office or like if your family or something, you like to play games, like that's from what I've heard, it's a lot of fun, multi like co op. Was, was it, oh. it Spunky or FTL? Spunky, Spunky. Spunky. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was my favorite game last year. I was gonna say that it's it's cool with other people, unless those other people are like my friends or the giant bomb crew or you know, Anyone who will grief you or just Troll. like, just, yeah, yeah. Exactly. well, then it's still fun, just not for one person. I'll play FTL on the PC Gaming Hub. It's the same kind of fun that, like, you know, New Super Mario Brothers multiplayer is, is fun. Yeah. If you just hate yourself. Uh, so, anyway, I, I guess sort of steering towards this question, um, during the last podcast, you talked about how much you like playing Bioshock. Have oh, yeah. you finished it yet? Yeah. Bioshock, well, Bioshock one that the first. I, the one that I finished. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so you have... Oh, no. Okay. Because I really wanted to do the follow-up question as to whether you finished Infinite or not. Have you finished Infinite? I haven't started that one yet. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. Oh, man. No, I, See, I, I have... I have since, since the last time you were on the show, I have since finished both Bioshock 1 and Bioshock Infinite. And I, I actually really enjoyed one. I thought it held up really well, hmm. especially from like an art point of view. Yeah. Like, the way the way the, a lot of the lighting works and... Um, what the hell is the guy's name? Um, Like, the theater level. And where you have to like, right? Uh, is it Fort Frog? Where you have to like go take the pictures of all the dude's subjects? I think, yeah, I think so. Yeah, because like I was like iffy on the game until it got to that point, and um, they really started to use the lighting, especially with the spotlights following you around in the main atrium and everything. And I was like, okay, I, I can see what the big deal was with this game. And it really clicked from there. I, I, my well, my question would be like, what would, what'd you finally take away from Bioshock? Like, there's the quiz, twist ending and all that kind of stuff, but I'm suspecting you didn't necessarily that that isn't your only observation with bioshock um was it josh I, specifically okay i was like what? i don't care about you Shinboy. oh <laughs> i care about you uh, what did i take away i i really like that it was such a boilerplate genre piece but within that there was so much room for creativity right. that you don't see in most of those kind of games and that's inspiring to me is is to take a trope laden, you know, experience and put enough twists and bumps that make it interesting and feel new and fresh, even though the mechanics aren't new and fresh at all. Yeah, I was, I was going to say that that actually is um really similar to some of the games you've been playing recently because like you have um what's, what's the face not Mark Mark of the Ninja, which essentially just reinvents stealth, in my opinion, mm-hmm. just t- totally changes up. What we. What, do, do you enjoy the way that they do stealth in that game? Yeah, well, to see, it's kind of, it, it feels unfair to me because <laughs> there's so many uh, stealth-based games that are in 3D yeah. that fall short of it, but it's because <laughs> they're in 3D and it's so much harder to do. I'm so glad I didn't just say, like, Guild Wars 2. <laughs> you know, the best stealth game. <laughs> But no, yeah, I, I totally agree because by removing that third element, you can have stuff like pots being hide, like you can hide behind a pot, and it would make complete sense from that two D plane. But if you try to do that in the three D space, it just doesn't work at all because it it make it creates a dissonance with the player. What about yeah. like in Skyrim where you put the pot over their head and then you're invisible? <laughs> <laughs> now, on on the subject of three uh, D <laughs> stealth game, did you ever play Dishonored or have you uh, looked into that at all? Yeah, I started Dishonored. I really wanted to like it. I probably put in about six hours into it. Yep. And I kind of felt I kind of felt the opposite uh, uh, as I did about um, Bioshock, where it's all of these familiar elements and and they're all done really well mm-hmm. and they're all cohesive and it's 
should be a great game, and it just didn't grab me for whatever reason. I, even though I, I love things. steampunk, I love the aesthetic. I, I think first person uh, stealth in 3D game. I, uh, I don't know. Just didn't grab me. Nice. No, I, I totally. Yeah, I like, it's actually like really interesting because uh, Shinboy and I, and I were actually having a conversation about just that this afternoon. And I don't know if you have you played Far Cry Three at all by chance. No. Okay, it's interesting because actually one one of the things we both agreed on because he actually didn't didn't care for Dishonored and I thought it was great, um, specifically the stealth elements, was that Far Cry Three not being a stealth game at all actually has probably some of the best um, first person three D stealth in any game ever. Huh. They, they just did they they did such a great job of of allowing the player to feel kind of like that 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 um you know badass ninja guy <laughs> hiding out in, in the tall grass and i think a lot of what helped with that that you know dishonored just isn't capable of doing just given the um the design of the environments is that with far cry 3 you have kind of a, a big open area like say you're like attacking like a, an outpost or something you have a big open area that the player can kind of move around in and plan their attack and, and so on whereas with like dishonored um and, and a lot of other um you know first person 3d stealth games it's it's a little bit more I don't want to say corridor based, but it's a lot a lot narrower areas, a lot less area for the player to kind of maneuver around and and get a good kind of bird's eye view or even just um you know a 360 view of the area and, and kind of plan that attack out. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll check it out. I I love the idea of stealth and I and I love the idea of finding a place where it's implemented well. I just haven't yet. Yeah, if that's the case, I would totally recommend Far Cry Three and then just limit yourself to the bow. <laughs> oh, the bow. It's like, or if you don't want to, if you don't want to spend all the money and you want something that is equally fun but double the dumb, you get Far Cry Three Blood Dragon because it's basically Far Cry Three, <laughs> but if it were a dumb '80s action movie. Yep. That sounds like uh, what, uh, what's the one with the scorpion wire where you pull yourself up to jet planes and then oh, I just, oh, yeah. um, just just cause. Yeah, yeah, just. Cause. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, except is... with uh, with Far Cry Blood Dragon, it's actually when it's like a dumb '80s action movie. It's a dumb '80s sci-fi B action movie. Yeah, uh-huh. you play like a cyber commando, basically. There's a button it's really for dumb. pulling. Is it, a, is it a mod or what? <laughs> no, 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 it's it's, it's, it's a, a um, deal like standalone a, expansion. Standalone, yeah, standalone expansion thing. Yeah. It's like fifteen bucks. Yeah. That's cool. To give you an idea How of cool like the that? tone of it, there's a button for pulling the one finger salute. Um, and that, that's that's the kind of I, that, that's everything about that game. It's, it's actually encapsulated. just it's like having played Blood Dragon. That's just the melee button when you're not in range of meleeing <laughs> yeah. people. Yeah, not to mention you do it with your robo arm. Yeah, well, you can. Yeah. Does it oh, alternate? I think it alternates. You can do the. I think it alternates. Homer, it alternates yeah. Um, God damn it! That game looks so cool. But yeah, I mean, it also has you know dragons that shoot lasers. So, excuse blood, me, blood, blood dragons shoot. that shoot I'm lasers. Sorry. Blood Dragons. Yeah. All right, moving on. Uh, I have another a question. Game you're curious whether or not you played. Yeah, I go ahead, and, uh, Cynic. You want to um, ask it? Because I, every time Josh speaks, I have like a million more questions. Um, you, so you, you like the idea of stealth games. Had, have you played some of like the classic ones, like Metal Gear Solid? Yeah, sure. Class? You mean Thief, if you mean classic <laughs> stealth games. <laughs> Wait, which came I, for, I, I, played, I think Metal Gear I came have for played Thief. Thief 1, or, or was it Thief 2? Hmm. I think I it was know. Thief 2. Um, and and Metal Gear Solid. What are your thoughts and on Metal Gear? Metal like, Gear Solid is third person, so it's easier and better to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Wait, hold on. Speaking it's of Thief Two and Bioshock, wasn't Thief Two another Ken Levine joint? Was yeah, it? Yeah, I yes. So. Yes. Mm, okay. But he was he like ba- barely touched that. I remember him being on the show when they were talking about Thief, and he like barely. He he, he yeah he he only he didn't do too much work on Thief. Say so he gets spicy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when I worked at Outrage and we were working on Descent Three, I mean that's when he was kind of in his prime, and and we were definitely looking at a lot of games like that. I mean, when we were looking at you know spaceship stealth mechanics, <laughs> you know, we were looking at <laughs> Bioshock or not? What's the one that System Shock? System right? Shock, yeah, yeah, System right, Shock yeah. too. Nice. Was was Metro Twenty Three like stealth? Intentional, or because I always felt like when I played it, I could never successfully get through the area stuff. I have not played that game. So. Uh, it's not. It's not very stealth heavy. I think it's just you turn off lights, and that yeah, makes it's you hard stealth. to. It's yeah. hard to go through the entire game without fighting because Actually, they throw you into fighting. No, you know what's a good first person stealth game or has stealth in it? Um, Human Revolution. 
Deus Ex. That's that actually has decent stealth in it. If yeah, if the boss fights weren't terror bad, then yeah, it'd be good. Yeah, the boss I've got that on my stack. I I own it. I haven't played it yet. You'll probably love you it because it. their image of like they did a really good job of um kind of combining the '80s view of the future, like that Blade Runnery kind of view of the future, and also like a new modern modern twist on it because it's still um Asian dom- dominated that kind of stuff, but. In the 80s, when we thought about Asian-dominated futures, it was a very different thing to how we think about it today. So they kind of did a really good job of just meshing those two. And I would yeah, love the difference to hear. between Japan and China. I yeah, guess. exactly. Difference between that and like different um, well, well, catalysts for why that future came to be and how that affects the world. I, th- I thought like the world-building human revolution was one of the best in recent The only times. thing that bothers me um, is that I took a helicopter flight from Detroit to Shanghai <laughs> in that game. <laughs> I don't think I don't think that's a thing that would happen. Well, helicopter. It's, it's a future helicopter. Future. That, that it's helicopter had jets. Helicopters. It had jets. I mean, I future. guess. All right, I guess we'll just move on to the. I guess the main topic: pseudo Guild Wars. Josh Foreman, I hear you helped make the Super Adventure Box. Oh wow! Yes. Is that, is is that rumor true? Can you confirm or deny that? <laughs> I think I'm allowed to say that I worked on it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Perhaps some, uh, some well, like some yeah. retro game you were working on that you wanted to hint at or the, at a previous interview. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. So <laughs> you want the you want the spiel? I, I think I can answer several of the questions that are there just in one kind of synopsis. Sure. Okay, so th- this is how it went down. I'm working on the Halloween Mad King jump puzzle, and I'm like, yeah, okay, so. This, that was the first time we put a jumping puzzle in its own map, which meant there were all sorts of things we didn't have to be concerned with that you have to when it's in a regular map. And then it occurred to me, why don't we have a jumping puzzle dungeon? That would be so great. And then I just went, it, it, because I've been so influenced by the classic like Miyamoto type games, uh, I mean, all through all the jumping puzzles I've done, I thought, well, this, this is where I should do it. Right. So, so and 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 it started out. So well, the way uh, ArenaNet is set up right now is we have you know our various living world teams, and then we got our world view world team, PvP team, et cetera, et cetera, right? And but then we also have this other kind of uh, well, it's called base camp, and it's basically where people don't have a specific goal per se. It's kind of like our R and D division, and um, so I got thrown into the, you know, I, I pitched my idea to, to a couple people, you know, Colin and Izzy and uh, Dave D. And they said, uh, that sounds like an interesting idea. And uh, so I got to go to base camp and just start develop. Well, after after we wrapped up the, the uh, Winter's Day stuff. And um, so I just started kind of working on that with one or two other people. And uh, the goal was always to have base camp kind of be this little incubator for interesting, innovative ideas that will weave into the future of Guild Wars, right? Okay, kind of kind of to get that that indie scene bootstrap sort of, you know, hey, we're just this tiny little team and we've got this little vision and we're going to try to try to make it happen. And um, so we were the first team that really got promoted from that. That was always their idea was, you know, people generate these ideas, they work on it for a little bit. If it looks like it's got promise, then they kind of say, okay, great, let's make this a real thing. And so once that happened, they added a couple more people to the team, like a producer, that kind of stuff. And uh, at the end, we we're eight people, including producer. And uh, yeah, so that that's kind of how that happened. <laughs> in, in in short, oh, okay, that, let's, let's just like re- quickly rearrange our questions because I got through. Uh, no, I, it's... Really, because I'm up first, right? Because we're going to be doing questions in segments. I'm the first segment, followed by Durin, then Thurbleton, then Shinboy. Um, so I get to d- have the first whack. So y- you were the lead? Is that, is that correct? Am I crazy here? Did I mishear all of that? Or did you are a lead on um, Super Adventure Box? Uh, I think it was more so like, it's you, well, if I'm understanding it correctly, you just said like, hey, can I go to this base camp, AK, just a big sandbox area, work on this? And then you come back like, whoa, this is really looking into something. This is like some cool. The higher up said, oh, okay, here's a team of people. You're in charge of stuff now. Yeah. And it, 
yeah. was that like did it feel like a weight had been put on your shoulders like i i'm now responsible for something almost or <laughs> uh a little bit i mean it, it it's it was still small enough where it was not that big a deal i i always wanted to keep our foot footprint really small i mean at first it was just to avoid being noticed so that we could do whatever the hell we wanted right <laughs> and <Nice>. uh <laughs> And then at some point, you know, uh, we had to be like, oh, hey, important people, look what we're working on. <laughs> and, uh, and and at that point, you know, we got more resources and stuff, but it was still small enough where, you know, technically I was uh, a, a coordinator is what they're called. And the idea is that's, that's the vision holder who kind of keeps everything going on a uh, coordinated path. Right. I guess. Nice. Uh, so, yeah, and, and it wasn't really... You know, it didn't turn me into a producer or a lead or anything <laughs> like that. It was just, you know, I'm making these levels and now I've got a scripter helping me and now I've got a prop guy helping me and now I've got a programmer, you know, okay. that sort of thing. So, uh, oh man, I, I, I kind of want to throw these questions in because one of the first things I wanted to ask was at what point did, um, let's say, am I saying these names cor- correctly, McLean Deemer and Five Chappelle? Is that is that right? The composers no, of the, uh, sorry? I said, no, no, that's not right at all. <laughs> job, I co- did I completely screw up those names? Is, is that... What yeah, that's okay. So You'll so have to forgive McClane, his Australian English. It's yeah. sometimes chopped up. <laughs> M- McLean is our, is our in-house musician, and awesome. Leif is a uh, content designer, but he's also he also has a degree from some prestigious musical university. Nice. I don't remember which... <laughs> And so what then, so that they got involved, because I absolutely cannot stop listening to the Super Adventure Box music. Isn't it amazing? I I think it absolutely holds up to the best, like, that came out of Capcom and Konami. Yeah. Been, oh, yeah, it's, it's great. It's shocking to me. <laughs> it, it is incredibly uh, yeah, good. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we just have good musicians here. Uh, <laughs> you know, Leif, Leif just kind of did it on weekends and evenings just because he, he did chip tunes. In, yep. to begin with anyway and that's just kind of a passion of his nice wait so so did, did you were you part of that creation process or did you just go all right i'm gonna make the music for this and you're like okay you know i wanted to be <laughs> i tried to be i sent them all my little demo tapes of you know, little, <laughs> little music that i've made and they ignored it all which is, which is <laughs> so th- there was no like you going looking at them and going no this isn't good enough go back to it no. Uh, well, I mean, I created a document for them outlining the each of the zones and mm-hmm. the mood that I wanted to communicate. And, and then, you know, they took it from there. And I mean, every time they brought something back, I was like, this is 20 times better than I thought it would be. Good job. You know? <laughs> yeah. Because no, I, I was just um, listening to an interview with the guy maker of um, Thomas Was Alone. You probably haven't heard of it, but um, he was talking about how yeah. he just started working with a like a dude straight out of college for the soundtrack of that. And how it kind of went down was he was was like, okay, here are my ideas. These are just like general scoping of ideas and like pictures that would somehow evoke what he was lo- looking for, for the soundtrack. And the dude would just come back to him and he would just start crying with how good the stuff was coming back with. Um, but like he, his like summary of that was he's impressed with some, um, game makers as to their ability to um not accept that and 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 actually have criticism and so forth so forth like like one of my favorite things recently is if you finish bioshock infinite in the um credits you see ken levine talking with the guys who end up singing pretty much the major song for that um game which is will the circle be unbroken and um he's sitting there and he's put under like the really interesting and uh, crazy circumstance of talking to these like really talented artists and going uh so that was amazing but i kind of want it like this instead <laughs> and yeah, it was it funny was, it was, it's more like that was amazing i kind of want it not quite as amazing he's like that was that was too I think that's, professional. Uh, that's lucas's technique right <laughs> <laughs> that explains oh, everything oh man shots fired well, okay, so there were there were two, I think, two particular sounds in the music mm-hmm. that I was like, I don't, that is that really eight bit? That doesn't really sound. <laughs> yeah, but, but that was so minor, and it was like, 
You're pretty no, much just right. like, this would sound better if it sounded worse. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like you guys set up an indie studio within ArenaNet is what this is sounding like. Yeah, well, it, it's really exciting. That's that's kind of how we're working the whole living world system is is following the indie game model. To, I mean, to an extent, obviously, right. we're all part of a but anyway, we have healthcare and that yeah. kind of stuff. So, but uh, <laughs> you know, so taking out loans, right? <laughs> but yeah, we have a lot of power given to us, and we're trusted with that. You know, and, and we've got several kind of gates that we go through, where you know, Colin and Izzy and Mike Z will come and check out what you're what you're doing and say, eh, steer it this way or that way. But I mean, for the most part, we're really left to our own devices, and that's really cool. Um. So my follow up question would be. And I, I, I swear I wrote this down somewhere, but I can't see on this cell sheet anymore. So I've accidentally deleted it. Um, so from start to finish, and this is like going to, going to be one of those grognard questions. Um, from start to finish, what was the actual, how did Super Adventure Box happen in terms of like internal development? Did you start with the levels or did you start with this like concept art or, and, and, and what, at what point did other people start chipping in? Because you were kind of like the, the genesis of this. So what was the overall? Okay, so step one was I wrote up a vision document that right. was about a page. I don't know, it was probably like two or three paragraphs, really. <laughs> and emailed it to, you know, the environment lead, to, to Colin, uh, to Chris Whiteside, or producer of producers, um, and said, here's an idea. And, and <laughs> like I said, they, they threw me in base camp and said, uh, Go for it. Now, now Basecamp has several artists, uh, a couple animators, a a variety of different disciplines, right? So um, the environment lead, uh, Dave B, he uh, was like, he kind of looked at who was in Basecamp, uh, what the proclivities were, and there's another guy there who built, he's more on the prop side, and he's super into retro gaming, right? So it was like, good fit. So um, through, he threw him on, on my team. Um, I specifically asked for uh, Lisa because I've worked with her a couple times in the past. And well, what does she do? The, she's a content designer. Okay. So she's the one who makes it actually work. Right. Okay. <laughs> yep. bounce, mushrooms bounce you and lets you <laughs> have, you know, hearts instead of a health bar and you know, all that kind of stuff. Nice. Right? Oh, so she's the one who made that like really awesome retro UI. No, I did the UI. Well, okay, I did the art for the UI. Our programmer made it so that we could mod the current UI. And then Lisa has to script it so that when you go into Super Adventure Box, you're basically given all these buffs and transforms and whatever so that it applies to your character. Oh, cool. Okay, that makes sense as right. a unit. That's it. Seems like yeah. a good idea. So yeah. it was us three for a while. And, and, then, and then we got an animator who's also into retro stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was a great just confluence of people that all had the same passion and they were directed towards each other by a uh you know a leadership structure that has a clue what they're doing so it's it's really cool and so what kind of timeline were you talking about like how long did that did that team take to come together uh the 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 three no i guess it was the four of us were almost uh, within one week of me coming into base camp, the four of us got together and we started having meetings for about a couple, a week, maybe two weeks, you know, not nothing but meetings, but we would meet and then we'd try to make a little something and then we'd meet again. And, you know, it's basically just going over all of our memories of, you know, eight and 16 bit games and what we really liked about them, what we disliked about them. Should we include the stuff that we dislike because that's such a vital factor in what they feel like? I need examples. What did you not like? That is so interesting. (laughs) Well, I mean, the the first obvious thing about an 8-bit game is that it's super difficult because they couldn't make, you know, a six-hour experience where you just progress from A to B. You have to die over and over and over and over yeah and the question was do we want to go that way you know what and and in a lot of ways because we're such a small team we had very similar uh limiting factors you know we can't make a game that's as long as you know uncharted or whatever and let you just blow through it um so some of those things you know not having continues or or a limited amount of continues (laughs) um 
I mean, when I first came up with the idea, we were thinking of it more like an arcade game paradigm where you would actually purchase coins. I knew it. For, I was going to ask, it was quarters a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we were like, can we actually make it cost a quarter every time? And, <laughs> you know, that just kind of went against the overall arena net, you know, right. Wars 2 philosophy. <laughs> like, um, it, it seemed more like an arcade game that was then transferred to, like, a, a, an at-home console. Not to quote the, yeah. the uh, uh, trailer you guys did, which was hilarious. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it? yeah, it's almost like continues were, like, a joke thing. You could easily get back in. Right. But it's, yeah, you, you still had that fear of, of like, dying or whatnot and then having to start from the beginning but yeah. it wasn't as hard to restart yeah yeah so uh there was that and then there was the um the things uh, i'm trying to think of other things that we that we all hate about uh <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure you guys will remind no, me i mean we, no, we had a very long list. that's totally cool now I, I was i was because we can probably go on so that was like what three weeks already so the, you're past scoping and with general ideas on the table of what you want to put together. Yeah, that I'd say the first two or three weeks was that, and then the aesthetic, like getting the aesthetic established and approved, and that right. was actually a, a really big process because um, <laughs> there were several things we were trying to stay away from. Yeah, uh, several things we were trying to go towards. Uh huh. Uh, for, yeah. for instance, we didn't want to make it look like Minecraft. And still, every time <laughs> anyone goes in, they're like, oh, it's Minecraft! <laughs> you know, it's I can't think of anyone, especially on this podcast, who would think that. <laughs> I think it's, it's just an unfortunate thing you're going to run into when you try to do like an 8-bit style in a 3D world, though. Yeah, yeah and, and really that's exactly there We're both 3D games referencing an 8-bit game. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, yeah, you, you can't totally escape that. But we tried several different methods to, to make an 8-bit world in a 3D game. And one of them was like almost literally Minecraft. Like everything was made out of the same size cubes. Uh, and we tried, <laughs> we tried a variety size of cubes to where it was more kind of a voxely world. But then we had all these kind of curves and stuff that we weren't happy with. So we basically established this rule of all, of all 90s and 45 degree angles. Okay. And that really See, helped to that guide Channel, now but. that you've mentioned that, I'm really hoping you guys do a voxel one at some point. <laughs> maybe just maybe just a hidden voxel area, but like <laughs> it's the majority. Like it's something I'm curious about, uh, especially with. I'm not sure if this is a question. I'm sorry if I'm jumping in on it, but with the whole infantile mode, uh, and we can like discuss that later. You're having to make a set path, and that sort of reduces the ability for folks going on that method to see all the little nooks and crannies you guys threw in there. Yeah. Uh, like the hidden areas, the side paths. Uh, did, like, what, did that bug you or did you guys not like, not worry about it? Cause there weren't a whole lot to begin with. Did you want to add a lot more uh, side uh, areas? Well, I mean, one of the very first reasons I wanted to do a jumping puzzle dungeon was cause I wanted to have variable difficulties. Right. Um, because I know a lot of people don't like jumping puzzles and they just skip over them. So the idea of having an easy mode, is that you actually include more people, you know, and, and they may get 20% of the experience that someone who does regular mode gets, but that's more than 0% of the experience. I'm, right? I'm going to say, Josh, that I yeah. did it and only in infantile mode, and I thought you did a fantastic job. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. got, me and Nubarama were able to go through that whole jumping puzzle on, like, because we didn't barely have time anymore. Well, I, I yeah. Nubarama doesn't. So we, we were able to jump in and just, like, walk over all the difficult stuff and point to it. Oh yeah, I can see why that would suck. And then just right. keep walking. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I also I have think, to say like, like kudos to you guys for calling it infantile yeah. mode. Yeah. <laughs> well, first it was, uh, we were calling it baby mode. And, uh, <laughs> infantile <laughs> mode just sounds way more poetically insulting. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, we, we got our writer, uh, Peter Freeze, and uh, he's got a very sly sense of humor and, and understands the Silvar, or sorry, the the Asura really well. And yeah, that, that was that was his take on it. Is, is, this is what an Asura teacher would consider this mode, right? <laughs> that's yeah, that's great. So wait, so was the infantile mode part of that first? Like, did you guys like sit down at the table and go, okay? When you were scoping out this project, did you go, okay, we want multiple difficult levels from the start? Or did that kind of evolve as you went into it? And did everyone no, agree? It was, it was from the start, for sure. Uh, three modes were planned from the start. Mm -hmm. And we had to cut uh, hard mode at near the end of the project just wow. because 
we found out near the end that we were kind of doing it a, a, an expensive way where it was constantly hounding the server for oh, okay. you know, well, technical reasons. Yep. And so we, we had to kind of put that on the back burner till next release. Oh, okay. So, there will, so you guys are actually planning for a hard mode? Yeah. What's absolutely. the difference? Like, what, what do you actually put in there to make it more difficult? Um, okay. So there's, there's two basic ways you can make something more difficult, which is just increasing... Okay, I, I guess there's three ways. And, <laughs> there's and a couple, it's, it's but these kind of, are, these kind are three of a philosophical them. debate that, that we have amongst our team is, is how we want to approach it. But um, I mean, there's there's take everything that's already there and just you know make the bad guys hit points higher, make them hurt you more, right? Uh, you know, make the jumps a little further, um, at a time pressure, that sort of thing. Where yeah. it, it's basically the same thing but just ratchet it up a little bit. Um, and and then the other one is to just uh, to handicap the player, which is, you know, make it so you only have one life, you know, right. blah, blah, blah. And that's still essentially keeping things the same. Um, the, the one, the direction I really wanted to go that's most interesting to me, um, I don't know if you've ever played um, I Want to Be the Guy. Yes. Or uh, <laughs> yep. the, the predecessor to that, which I can never remember the actual Japanese name, but it's kind of known as Cat Mario. <laughs> was the, the first one I played like that, where it's it's a spoof of Mario and things just completely randomly kill you for no reason, and it just becomes kind of a muscle memory thing. So oh. if anybody doesn't know, a uh, a modern successor would be Super Meat Boy. Uh, to a certain That's definitely an easier version of it, but yeah. Well, so, okay, Super Meat Boy isn't capricious in the same way, where yeah. it will, you know, something that's normally a power-up will now kill you, or... Yeah. Something right. in the back. It's not trying to trick you. Like I'll say, I the, good, the, the good thing that I really like about Super Meat Boy is that it's tough, but if you die, you know why you died. Right. Yeah. That's that's the best kind of game. That's why I love Spelunky so much, was every time I died, I was laughing out loud at myself. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or Dark Souls. Um, oh, I missed when, time when, when you die in Dark Souls, you know exactly why you died. Yeah, yeah. that's another great example. Which is, which is awesome. So, so... That kind of hard mode, the the one where it's just capricious and and weird and unexpected, uh, that's the one that I was going for. So, so like a glitch, a, as if the game glitched. Almost. Nice. Uh, yeah. So so like the the pointy arrow hands, for instance, that that guide the way. Um, in hard mode, they rocketed towards you and killed you. You know that sort of thing. <laughs> That sounds uh, so cool. Uh, Thurlton, as the as the resident jumping puzzle dude, does that sound cool to you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he says with a sly smile on his face. Yeah, so no, it is a straight up grin. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, it's, a, it's a lot of trial and error, like very purposeful, very like uh, kind of a... It's almost like a mean playfulness to a certain extent. It's a different way of the developer to communicate with the player. And uh, we have a... Our, our QA principal on the project is really into super hard stuff. Like I asked for him specifically on <laughs> Super Adventure Box because he walked through my Mad King clock tower like his third or fourth try or something. Nice. And so he's just incredible. And 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 he's totally into that kind of masochistic like <laughs> throw yourself against a brick wall a hundred times. And and so yeah, we're 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 going towards that. The idea is like. At some point, you will build up 99 lives in Super Adventure Box, and you'll be like, now what do I do? And the answer is hard mode. And you will eat through those lives super fast. <laughs> but would you get more, like, is your idea to have, to reward the player way more on that mode? Or like, or do you just want to have it hard for the sake of, like, enjoyment right. and not really about rewards and so on and so forth? Yeah, I mean, we have to be careful about how we reward things that are that require specific things, such as a good, you know, ping and and a fast computer, and right. you know, so exactly. stuff that that are limited through no fault of their own. Uh, but on the other hand, yeah, I mean, we we can certainly give acknowledgement, like you did something great. I, my my ideal thing would be to give. Like we actually created a, you know, the the frog boss at the end. We created a little rotating crown that that you could wear if you beat hard mode, but we cut hard mode so you won't have that. So, you know, something like that or, or a mini pet that's exclusive to people who have beat it on hard mode or whatever, something like that. Right, because it's, it's interesting, interesting to me because as a person who doesn't really go into games for the hard mode, like I'm, 
I've started playing We're content games tourists and in... yeah, content, I'm content tourists, tourists like Gary Witter. Um, I started playing games on easy this year, and I don't want it. I don't think I'll go back. I just really like just experiencing things for the the sake of experiencing things, just to see everything that's in it, um, or at least have touch on stuff that are that is in it. So, it, from your perspective, what's the balancing act between putting content in for rewards versus putting content in for the experience because a lot of players would go okay if hard mode is the only way to get x then i have to do x right yeah um yeah that's that's a really interesting issue um i always approach things from an experience perspective Mm -hmm. and i just don't care about the rewards and and that has to be balanced by you know because 90 percent of the people playing you know, you see it on the forums, like, I have no reason to play this because there's no rewards. Right. <laughs> so It's like, well, how about how about it's fun? Is that yeah. is that a good reason? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, figuring out how the reward structure works right. and how it, it both honors the, you know, kind of the, the vision of the experience versus how it fits in with the overall economy and player expectations. It's a very complex equation. And do, do you have any input on that, or is that more like someone else's problem? Well, <laughs> what I what I try to do is I try to represent my perspective as you know coming from the experience angle and saying that this is what we want to provide, and then obviously you have to be open and receptive to the other you know pressures that are there to to reward people who want to be rewarded in ways they want to be rewarded. So right. I, I don't think we were completely successful um, with. Uh, getting both of those goals this first time, and I think we're going to be a lot, a lot better at it uh, the second time. Now that we've been through the process and we have a better idea of what Super Adventure Box is, and and all the other teams, you know, the the economy team, and um, you know, everyone else has a sense of of what we're trying to accomplish. I think uh, we'll we'll have a lot better solution. If, if... At the risk of spoiling things for the future, are there any hints you want to give us as to things you're like looking down to, like for the next Super Adventure Box? Oh, it's the next release is going to be World Two, which is the mountains, right? I mean, we we, we purposely put a little spoiler, you know, or yeah, yeah. Like, right it. here's a sample for what's com- what's coming. But and, in terms of um, like um, rewards, or did, is there anything you want to hint at? Yeah, we haven't even had those discussions yet. I mean, we we've, we've kind of. We, well, we've kind of talked a little bit here and there, but just as the Super Adventure Box team, not with Izzy and, and <laughs> you know the, the other people who really have to weigh in on it. Uh, I guess so, a question I'd have for you is, is it easier or more streamlined this time around, or is it, once again, more or less starting from scratch? Like, it's did you have, like, World 2, like, you know, the first half planned out when you guys were doing the, like, the, the roundtable meeting sort of things, or is it, well, okay... Great. Like now we have to get some of those ideas, but we still have to figure out what we're doing with all of this. Yeah, during the roundtable, we had we planned out all four worlds mm-hmm. and had you know plotted out the progression of all the items and weapons and all that kind of stuff. So, and and our intention was to was to try to make all four worlds. Like and, the I- items and weapons being like the keys and the torch and all that. Like the in, yeah, like, the, the in game items. And yeah, that's that's so hard to the, explain. The in game, in game, inner in game. game. <laughs> Yeah, we still haven't come up with with uh, good lingo for that. Actually, <laughs> I guess essay specific. Cool. There you go. There so I yeah. So I want to rewind a bit because I I really want to get an idea of how the whole process works. So you're at week three. You finished your um, prepping essentially. What's the next step yeah. from there? That, that was step one. What's step two? Okay, so step two was uh, we've we've got our solid design Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got our design document our plans um we've uh built not a not a functioning level at all but we have little kind of stage platforms of you know here's an area of a forest kind of and here's sort of a field and and here's where you start there the, the lobby and all that kind of stuff right um and and so the next step was okay. Well, let's make a the first zone. And all right. That that's where we started. How long does that take usually? Or for the, how long did it take for you? And how long does it usually take? It it varied because there 
there wasn't like a point where we said, okay, the aesthetic is completely established and set in stone and everything's figured out. Now right. go, right? It was yeah. an ongoing process of, you know, showing it to, to Daniel, showing it to Dave B, saying, does this work for you? You know, um, and and then making the, the gameplay function with that. <laughs> making it work. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm so, so I'm the, sure... the first zone probably took um, uh, maybe two months wow. to, to really get that hammered to the point where we were like, okay, this feels like a, a, a product that we're, we're happy to go forward with. And that, that's, that include publishing oh. stages oh. or was like, is, is that just straight up just building it out took the two months? Um, that was all the, the building it, the scripting it, going back and forth on the aesthetics, you know, rebuilding the mountains several times, redoing the texture several times. Um, yeah. And, and, and a lot of that, a lot of that was also dealing with, um, be, be, because we, we changed so many things with the player skills and everything. Right. Um, you know, we shrunk them down and we, uh, we don't actually speed you up, but we make it so whenever you get into combat, you get a speed boost so that you, you effectively don't um, okay. slow down. And then uh, initially we had the bounce pads in the first zone and stuff like that. So there was a lot of just figuring out all these uh, systems, you know, getting the programmers help and, and Lisa figuring out from her end how to actually hook all that stuff up. So it was a there were a lot of things converging. Right. And. To do the second zone was half the time, and then the third zone was probably a quarter of, of the time, just because we had hashed out most of that stuff by that point. Along the same lines, like you were talking about, like we're having to rebuild the mountains numerous times and stuff. Like, is it? Did you find it harder or easier to like model around this um, the, these retro graphics and stuff? Um, it, at first, it was super hard. Like I said, establishing something that everyone was happy with, and once once we had it um it's super fast so i mean it, <laughs> you know they're they're right angles and you know really nice simple yeah. textures and stuff yeah because yeah, okay. i'm sure i'm sure like initially you're just looking at just the texture not on anything you're like okay that looks good and then you know you get in game and standing in front of it with like a regular you know guild wars character model or just a certain lighting and you're just like oh this doesn't look good at all you need to work <laughs> on this yeah there was definitely a lot of that. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, making pixel art is an art in and of itself. Right. And then making pixel art that works in a 3D environment is another layer of art in itself. And then making it all communicate a coherent tone and, you know, work with the gameplay is, is another layer on top of that. So it, it, it seems like such an easy, you know, because it looks so simplistic right. and cartoony and obvious, like yeah. we should just be able to pound it out. But it was actually a really in-depth process. What were your, like, would you mind enlightening us into how that worked out? Like, especially like with textures, that does sound like it should be easy. Like, what was, what were your major hurdles? What were your stumbling blocks? Well, at first it was deciding how pixely we wanted to go. I mean, we even experimented with uh, using triangle pixels, <laughs> you know, to give it more of an Asura right. holographic thing or whatever. Yeah. Um, and and mixing in like a little bit of photograph. So it, it still had some kind of realistic rock or grass texture or something like that. And just the more we pushed it towards the, the straight up, you know, homage, Eight bit look, the the more cohesive everything became, um, and the the specific difficulty after we ach achieved, you know, after we decided, okay, it was just straight up, you know, sixty four by sixty four pixel rock <laughs> texture, grass texture, uh -huh. was then okay. We're putting this over a cliff face that's a, essentially two hundred feet long, you know, how does how does that work, and um, Tiling is definitely something you see in 8-bit games, and it's not something we were specifically saying, okay, we, we, you know, in regular Guild Wars, we try to avoid tiling by putting decals over things and, and having, you know, very complex shaders that let you do all sorts of tricks. Um, and with, with this, it was kind of like, well, we don't want to use super fancy shaders, but we also, it gets 
really monotonous when you see the same thing in a 3D environment where you can look down a hallway, right? It's not yeah. just on a screen where it's tiled eight times. You could potentially see it tiled 30 times. Yeah. And uh, so that was kind of tricky. And then figuring out the ambiguities of like, does this look like bark or does it look like snake skin? Or does it look <laughs> like oh. you know, so. Nice. I mean, those two materials are very, very similar, so I can understand <laughs> the confusion. Especially well, when, when you're working with 64 yeah. by 64 pixels. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting process. That's, that is cool. Um, all right, so so that, that was your two-month stretch. Was that kind of like when you were done? Could you like submit it and play it at two months? Or what else? What happened after you'd built it out? Like, Was there a QA? That, that'd be QA, right? Yeah, we got our, we got our embedded QA guy mm-hmm. uh, probably around that point. Right. And and I think I think that's around the point, you know, when we've had the first zone, it, I, I probably don't have all, all the dates. Right. I mean, everything yeah. mushed together. Yeah. We were all working a lot of hours just because we were really passionate about it. And right. Wanted to. <laughs> um, so, I, yeah, I think at that point was when, you know, we we had serious conversations about, OK, this is going to be a real project. This is your real uh you know, ship date, Mm -hmm. this is how you fit into the rest of Guild Wars, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, uh... Oh, go ahead. I can't remember where I was going, so go ahead. (laughs) No, I was going to say, like, because, like, the whole turnaround time for this, would it be, like, the whole three months? Like, were you essentially, did you start and finish in three months? Or, like, what kind of... For for all the Super Adventure Box? Oh, no, just for how much you've released um, in that first wave round. Gosh, it's it's actually really hard to remember. I, I feel like it was more like four or five months mm-hmm. from the very well, from when I first went into base camp. Yeah, like the, the last thing as far as I, I can like I know you're working on is just after the interview you talked about the uh, Christmas stuff, right? Like mm-hmm. you, like you did you did the town, which again that's very cool for like inside the airship. Like was it after that you maybe did like you know the the holiday break and all that, but then started working on Super Venture Box in the sandbox area. Uh, uh, what was it? Ground base cons- camp. Yeah. Base camp. Yeah, yeah. That, that's how it, that's how it happened. So it was like a, so yeah, like that's closer to four months, I'd say. Right. Yeah. Oh, cool. So, so do, would you say like the? St- I because what I really want is a is a mad scoop about what else you're working with, but obviously you can't give us that. But like, it, how how many teams are currently in um, base camp at the moment? Could you say? Well, base camp is its own separate entity. Right. Um, there's there's four living world teams of which um, we're we're going to be a part of once we uh, start up again. Uh, right out or a week after we shipped, we were kind of our super adventure box team was scattered off to deal with, you know, game wide bugs and uh, other content and stuff like that. I'm like currently I'm working on the June uh, team. Right living world team and then uh next month is when we'll all get back together and start on super adventure box world two um i guess i guess a question to ask is uh we again like with the last when we last talked you were uh Re-Net had still trying to dial down the right time it takes or like the the right time to develop stuff versus re- like quality of releasing so Absolutely. it's like do you want to do a one month you know speed rush to get halloween out or like uh four to five months to get like you know it's uh, whatever content out are right. there still teams that are still working sort of like four months or longer for content we have yet to see or has arena more or less more or less dialed down what they want for time to release uh well we have a variety of teams working on a, a variety of length of you know we've got people that are working on stuff that's not going to be released for maybe a year. I don't know. Um, and we have people working on the living world teams where we have several months usually to, to get that stuff out. So it really is like an R and D madhouse of people like just working on these ideas, tr- like making them into something awesome. I, I like to think it's a controlled madhouse. Yeah. <laughs> because like we had a discussion, I think it was either last week or the week before about um, how we as players like to experience content in Guild Wars 2. And there's essentially like two main camps of that. Like one camp was firmly like, yeah, we want new content every month. And, but me and Durin, I think it was, and maybe even New Brahma as well, were more along the lines of, we want to see something as like polished and awesome as Super Venture Box, like once every two to three months. And we're fine with waiting like that 
extended period of time for something that just has more quality or more work that went into it. It was more like a, a self-contained kind of experience. What, what are your thoughts on that? Like, where does ArenaNet stand on that kind of... I, I think we stand on both. I think, like I said, we have teams that are on a, you know, a, diff- a variety of wavelengths, like different cadences. So, so you're kind of like try, trying to do both as best as you can yeah, right? so, i mean there's there's a certain percent of the player base that right. will just completely lose interest if there's not some interesting new thing popping up every couple of weeks yeah and then there's people like you that are more about you know the the long-term sort of big picture right, right? So, and, and we need both of those those people uh, yeah, that, yeah because i've seen i've seen a lot of people that especially with the flame and frost stuff being roughly once a month um even if they only stay on for maybe the three or four days after it comes out, they're coming back every month. If mm-hmm. they don't have anything for say four or five months, yeah, they might have lost interest to the point where they won't bother. Yeah, exactly. And, and is Arena still like experimenting with release schedules, or are you going to try to commit to like because it currently has been one thing a month so far? Are you guys trying to stick to that, or are you guys experimenting still? I, I think in general, I, I mean, what what Colin said about it is. You know, basically, we're we're trying to be okay. I'm totally paraphrasing here, but <laughs> what I got from it was that we're we're trying to be very agile in how we respond to the response we're getting from the players. Basically, you know, what feels good to you guys? What you know is is this too hectic? Is this you know not polished enough? Is it not the right kind of experience? I mean, because the this sort of thing has never been done before. There's never been an MMO where the full time the company is just working on constant stream of content for free so it's it, it's it's a new world for everyone player base <laughs> and uh, developers cool I, so yeah, it's interesting i i, I guess yeah. what i'm saying is it doesn't make sense to like say this is our strategy this is set in stone we're absolutely doing this yeah and, you know there will be no dissent it's it's really just <laughs> feeling it out nice yeah it- that, yeah, that, that, that's just, that's pretty much answered a lot of my questions right there. So, so I, I think one of the other discussions we had in that same episode, which is um, our discussion as to what how rapid we wanted our content to come to us, or what we preferred there. One of the discussions that came up was, so why did Super Venture Box have to go away? Like, what, why did it? Why was it there for only a month and then go away for a while? Can you elaborate as to what the thoughts were behind that? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, right now, the strategy we're trying out is Mm -hmm. this, this kind of cyclical um, events that come and go so that there's, so that when, when people have a sense of, you know, they're going about their, their daily life, uh, I haven't hopped into Guild Wars in a couple days or a couple (laughs) weeks, let's see what, what new is, is happening now. Right. And, um, and, and I mean, there's also just the logistical issue of, if you leave, if you keep adding content and leaving it in, your player base just continues to fragment and splinter, and you know right. creates a, a sense of an empty world. Okay. Oh, yeah, so, so, so that's, that's actually a really follow, good point. That's kind of a follow-up question to that. Then um, I, I don't know if this is something you can really say or not, but is the intention kind of in-game for Super Adventure Box to once all the worlds are released to be out for good, or do you still plan on after World Four um, pulling it away again? Uh, I don't know. We have we haven't talked about that. Cool. Okay. Yeah, because... Fragmenting. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. I'll go ahead. Fragmenting the player base is a good point because I didn't even think of that. Because now I guess with the molten facility being the thing, everyone's doing that as opposed to having people going, "Hey, do we want to do? Um, do we want to do Super Adventure Box or do we want to do Molten Facility?" And say you only have a group of like six or seven people, mm-hmm. you're split, so you can't really form like a full group for either. Yeah, that's, sure that's, it's place. something that we learned as a company with Guild Wars 1 is we released, you know, crazy amounts of new content, new maps all the time. And, yeah. and that's exactly what happened was it just, it's like it's like a gas in a container, right? The bigger you make the container, the the less gassy it is. Yeah. Um, that just an idea, and I'm sure it's been brought up for like the maybe discussions or it will be brought up when you guys talk about it. Maybe like because the one thing I, I always – like sell people on for a super adventure box. It was the best April fool's joke in that it was a real thing. <laughs> Maybe yeah. like the, when it's, when you have all the four worlds completed, it just comes as the holiday event for April fools. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I could totally see something like that happening. I don't know. Cool. Uh, so part of my, 
at this, all, this all comes from that one discussion. We, we actually, I don't remember when we did this, but we actually talked about this for an extended period of time. Um, was for Super Venture Box, kind of the coolest thing about it is it has an internal progression system. Like you get those baubles, you spend them on stuff, you get stuff. And like, how do did, did you guys like really focus in on that? Was that part of your design doc or did, you, did that kind of like come in as like a happy coincidence? Well, we knew early on we needed to have external rewards mm-hmm. and it, you know, weapon skins seemed like the first obvious thing. Yeah. And, you know, my first obvious idea was, you know, the Minecraft pixel sword or whatever. And <laughs> yep. that was, that was quickly, uh, the kibosh was put on that, um, <laughs> cause it breaks people's immersion. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, aesthetically that was the second biggest hurdle for us was making everyone fit in. And of course, everyone's never going to be happy, right? But yeah. as many people as possible feel like, okay, this is an item that could really exist inside of Tyria, that this, you know, a CERN inventor created this holographic technology and he right. made weapons out of it. This is what they would look like, right? Yeah. Um, and That's so cool. they went through many iterations before they they got there. Because, um, so like, you guys had those bauble, like those, those digitized weapons and stuff. And the Fractals has Ascended Gear, and both are kind of internal progression systems in that you do this specific piece of content to get a um, resource related to that specific content to then spend on something that's permanently related to your character. Um, do you, what do you guys? What do you think of focusing on those internal progression systems versus just like, for example, giving you gold or whatever? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's that's just not my field of expertise. Right. So I I kind of. You know, I let the people who understand that stuff make those decisions. <laughs> cool. All right, all right. I'm I'm going to uh, I'll, I'll do one final question, but I want to move on because we are about like 45 minutes into yep. uh, part one, and we got two more sections to go. Yep. But I guess one one last question is uh, with, with World One at least. Um, no, it was World Two with, with the Dark Forest. As soon as like you entered it, the environment, like the the lighting became dim, and you couldn't see far enough, and like the 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 world changed and, and for it like feel wise mm-hmm. quickly ending as soon as you got out of it. But was that in any way shaped by like our, us talking about how awesome we love the environment lighting? Yeah, it was, it was your idea. And uh, we're sending you a check. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I didn't get a check. No, uh, it's in the mail. So, oh, okay. okay. Nice. Oh, okay. <laughs> that came about because uh, again, Zelda, uh, specifically, a, a really cool thing to me about the second Zelda game, Adventure of Link, is that you will get to this cave that you have to go through in pitch black. And later you get the candle and then you go back and you're like, I'm completely empowered now. Right? <laughs> yep. Um, so, so I wanted to get kind of that. But we're in 3D again, which has all sorts of limitations. I couldn't put you in pitch black without a candle. Because you literally could never find your way out. So instead, it was just fairly dark. Right. Um, and by, by World 2, we'll have areas that we can make, you know, completely black. Because right. you have to have the candle by then. Yeah, not to mention, like, an issue would, you would have, at least with World 1, like, with World 1, with World 2, it's going to be uh, easier because everyone wants candles. But it's great when you're by yourself playing a, like, Legends of Zelda style thing. But when you have a group of five people and one guy doesn't know where he's going. Yeah. Trying to explain to him or, or track him down, it could be a very arduous. I'm sorry, Thurp. I didn't really mean to get lost that many times. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I I've, guess, yeah, since I'm the host, I'll ask one whoa, last silly question. I've, bo- I've boiled my, my questions into three staccato questions. Can I do those? Okay, go you, for it. You okay. had like six quick questions. Okay. All right. That, this three questions. quick. Josh Foreman, which is your favorite Zelda and why? The first one, because that's the first one I played and I grew up on it. Nice. All right, cool. Acceptable answer. Question I, the second. I, no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just so happy he didn't say Majora's Mask. Um, the second question was, um, time traveler question, if you were to work with one of the makers of the games which inspired Super Venture Box, who would it be and why? Uh, yeah, Miyamoto for sure. I'd have to learn Japanese. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, he was the biggest impact on my childhood. Like him and George Lucas are pretty much, that's who I am. Aww. You're George Lucas, excuse me. No, I, I'm, I'm the unholy offspring. Hey, why, why'd you sell Star Wars to eighties? <laughs> why'd you sell Star Wars to Disney? Sad face. No, I was the Could best. You sign my picture, my giant done. poster of George Jar Jar Binks. 
I'm his biggest fan. And <laughs> finally, my biggest biggest fan. Fan. third question, please, Cynic. What's your favorite element of Super Adventure Box and why? Uh, the hidden stuff. I love, I love making hidden areas, and there will be much more to come. Awesome. Yay. Uh, fourth quick shot question. Do you have a metric for how many times that guy's cart got broken? If so, how many? <laughs> no. But, you know. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, he lost cut. count. Best. All right. Um, I guess moving on to the second section, we just have some general uh, environment questions with the Guild Wars uh, world proper. Um, but starting off, just how difficult uh, was it to uh, make changes to live content, I guess, from a logistics standpoint? Uh, the best example I can give is, I don't know if you've played World vs. World as Red Team. In the Red Yaks Ben Keep, there is a chunk of stairs that is very visibly, like, not able to walk on. And just this, like, cube that <laughs> you can, like, be floating in 10 feet off the air on the stairs. And it's just like, why is this here? Uh, so on the line of trying to make changes uh, with the living story, like you added that whole zone in Wayf- Wayfair Foothills, uh, what like what kind of issues do you run against when you're trying to add stuff to existing content? Uh, there may be, well, I'm almost certain there's uh, a lot of considerations that the world be world uh, environment artists have to deal with that uh, we in Guild Wars 2 PvE area don't have to deal with. Yeah, like people sneaking over walls and uh, cheating, basically. Yeah, it's uh, I understand th- that area of it, but more along the lines of is it not worth it to make that small fix because like you'd have to have the server um, capacity to have everyone in the game download that one map and it isn't really worth it? Or is I, don't, it just... I don't think that's it because I think we're making changes and fixes all the time. I, without knowing the specific uh, issue, I couldn't really sp- speak to it. Um, I, I think in, in general, I mean, something that sounds that buggy would... How long has that been around? Since beta. <laughs> hmm. is it, I, I, don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. What yeah. Are, um, the, okay, I, I'm referring to is Red Keep of the Overlook Hills Keep is that by the jumping north? puzzle. Yeah, north. north. Okay. North, uh, just below the Lion Vista, um, where the, the, the portal that will soon be not important because they're making it its own map, but the portal to the jumping puzzle in Eternal Battlegrounds. You can't jump up those stairs or walk up well, those you stairs? Can, you have to walk on the right side, the left side there. You know what? I'm just, we'll scrap that question. <laughs> well, are we just deleting this? This never happened. No, no. <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing this live. I'll edit it out. Fine. <laughs> so. if, if, if you want to send me an email with coordinates, I will pass it along to the, the proper uh, authority to, to fix that. I'll send you um, a Google picture of me just Because we're, we're red team there. currently, um, and I was walking around there earlier, and I have no idea what you're talking yeah, about. I have no so. idea. All right. Well, uh, I guess another question along the same lines of making changes to the world. Um, are you restricted to, like, do you guys plan on making improvements or, or continuing stories of worlds? Because something that I think you're very passionate about is, like, t- making a story evolve and continue. And are you restricted in that, like, oh, I'd like to make this house be destroyed by, like, you know, events. Let's say, like, you know, a charred, like, uh, flame legion eventually destroy this town but you can't destroy that town because there's a story mission that happens in there so the town must always be pure like it, it, like it must always be standing so like do you guys plan on making changes to the existing world and if so what sort of speed bumps have you come across um yeah i'm not sure about that specific case i don't know that anyone's ever proposed you know bulldozing a town or or mucking with areas where personal story uh, quests happen. Um, I, I know that we've, we've talked about big, huge changing things and it, well, like, like you're pointing out, there's just all sorts of logistics with it. You know, if there's a person who gets to play two hours a week and they have their next story step and they can't do it because that city's closed down or whatever, you know, I, I don't know. There's, there's stuff like that. And then the, the bigger issue is coordinating all the changes between maps. Right. Um, so Lion's Arch, which is kind of like my baby, mm-hmm. uh, gets the most revisions to it because most of the holidays and stuff happen there. Right. And it's always kind of a juggling act to say, okay, so, you know, Halloween has their decorations up. 
and then, oh, wait, there's a bug in Trolls End I have to fix, <laughs> but now I have to fix it in two different maps, right? And and kind of having that, that mother map that holds the, you know, everything in, it's complicated and weird. It's kind of like a <laughs> multiverse situation. <laughs> Sort of, sort of related to Thurv's question regarding dynamic events. Without actually removing existing events, do you think there's really space for more completely new events to happen in the existing game as it currently is, without having it feel too cluttery? I, I think there's still, yeah, yeah, there's still spaces for it. Um, I mean, the, the, like for jumping puzzles and stuff, we're adding. You know, I'm adding one for June. Uh, that's fairly large and it just it's on what used to be a mountain range you couldn't get on you know? okay so okay so that was going to be a question i was going to ask is like say do you find it because something that i guess you guys carried over from the first game at least that i noticed is that while the maps are much larger and now they're not just all instances they all still sort of have roughly a squared off shape when it comes to the borders so if there's not really room like in the middle to add a jumping puzzle, I was going to ask like how difficult is it to maybe stick one around the edges or is it just easier to just sort of, okay, we're going to stick this on a part of the map where you haven't been yet. And yeah, there's a couple options we have. We, we can also basically tunnel down under the map and add caves and stuff like that under right. existing content. Um, and well, like in mountain yeah, that, and, stuff. And, and filling out corners and stuff is what we tend to do. Well, maybe you okay. can enlighten me on this because I was I thought you couldn't do that because for most maps that is I guess it depends on the ranging of the terrain, but the water level is a set level. Uh, yeah. So like, there's only so far down you can dig. If you're like choosing an area that is very elevated, that's wonderful. But there's like yeah, but most maps have a, a large enough range where there's plenty of plenty of uh, between the water and the surface area to fill up. Okay, very cool. Uh, I guess along the same lines of just uh, jumping puzzles are awesome and like to see more of them, and it's great that we're seeing some in June. Um, with uh, I recently had some friends join with the um, free weekend you did in April. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing I love to show them is like when they visit Lion Dart show them the um, Shark Maw Cavern because intro jumping puzzles – it's a really good one, and it's one that anybody can do because it's in a city. It's safe. Yeah. After that, it gets kind of hard of like, okay, I need to get a posse to escort you through this super hostile zone to do this jumping puzzle. Uh, and someone asked, do the, uh, they asked me, do you guys plan on doing jumping puzzles in the cities? Like maybe one like human uh, – in Vinny's Reach, one going through the uh, catacombs that were mentioned in the novels or – one where you're scaling the side of Radisson. Once they mentioned it to me, I got to look on the map and like, whoa, there's actually a lot of places to put jumping puzzles. I wonder if they plan on doing that. So has um, it crossed your mind? Yeah, it definitely has. I mean, I, I, I specifically made Shark, Shark Maw as the Disneyland of jumping puzzles. And, <laughs> you know, the, the, yeah, it's very much an introduction. Um, and it's all thematic and everything. And the, the yeah, putting other ones in cities is definitely, I, I'm almost sure it'll happen. You know, as different events and different uh, living world teams start branching out and start thinking of, you know, what are other interesting things we could do? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that'll happen. Hmm. Okay, well, that's cool. I like uh, it's. I wasn't sure if, like, you know, we're planning on doing, like, other stuff for those areas instead. And it's, like, we can't talk about it. It's... <laughs> Lots of things we could theorize and wanted to get your opinion on that. Uh, one last topic, I guess, and then we'll move on to uh, Shinboy's questions. Uh, with uh, I love the Super Adventure Box and like the guild puzzles, which we've just found out about uh, from our guild. We're finally catching up to everyone else. They are awesome. But one thing that worried me about it was it's like th it's this awesome mini dungeon that is – more or less gated. It's only certain guilds can do it, or you can only do it on certain times when the gate has been lifted and the event has been activated. And I can understand like wanting to put that gated material there, and I'm all for guild puzzles, but does this more or less rule out the idea of doing mini dungeons in the world, similar to um, 
can't think of the name of it, but they're like the, the frog one in Caledon Forest or um, the only Zul in uh, Lorner's Pass where you're fighting waves upon waves of destroyers getting through this dungeon area. That's actually a jumping puzzle, I think, but it's still really combat. Mm-hmm. So like, do you guys plan on ruling out mini dungeons or will we be seeing less and less of them as we see more and more guild puzzles that are really highly polished mini dungeons? No, I, I think uh, mini dungeons are a really good option for living world uh, teams to consider, you know, because, I mean, basically we're told you need to develop this month with content, come up with interesting ideas <laughs> and, you know, make it, uh, several teams have done dungeons, you know, like, like the one that just came out. And, uh, yeah, and, and we're also told, hey, having some stuff that sticks around in the world is great. And um, so that's certainly going to be on people's radars. Um, the, uh, for instance, the jumping puzzle I'm doing in June, that's going to stay in the world. Oh, cool. Um, so, Forever? yeah, I, 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 think, uh, I think we'll be seeing more of those, not, not less. Is is it something that you um, like? What well, is making a jumping puzzle easier because it's just like one uh, level designer working in a spare time, or like do, do the mini dungeons require more work because you're having to set up traps, place mobs? They're, uh, like, they're kind of on a spectrum. Like, there's some jumping puzzles that have hardly any scripting or content. Right? It's just here's a difficult series of jumps, and then there's ones that are full of traps and mobs and all that stuff. So. Um, yeah, a, a mini dungeon like like the one I did with Lisa in uh, range, the the underwater, you know, where you unfreeze the sword by pulling the chain, that kind of stuff. Um, that's that's not significantly harder than a typical jumping puzzle. So, okay, very cool. I've, I was curious about the how like the development process of that. Uh, that more or less covers my line of environment questions. Unless anybody has anything else, we can move on to I have Shin one, Boys. If it's an environment oh, question, yeah, like. please. Um, when I was doing the fractals a while ago, a long time ago, I guess now, but there was one level which is the you're walking up. And there's a giant on the side of the mountain. I keep forgetting. Does that have a, li- a name specifically? Am I cliffside is the name of cliffside. the fractal. So for cliffside, yeah. I'm terrible at jumping puzzles, which is why I prefer infantile mode. But at one point, I fell. I fell through that world, and then I and I was watching this on screen. I, I wasn't recording it, so I don't have footage of it. But I then feel, fell through another world, and then I fell onto a plane of flowers with mountains in the distance. <laughs> it sounds like something we should see in Injustice. <laughs> And that was like that was it. It was just my dead corpse there, and I couldn't map out because I didn't think I, I was able to bring up the. Ma- oh no! You found Elysium. Just, Good job. What? What? Where's? What? Is that Elysium? <laughs> no, I'm joking. It okay. sounds like a bug. Okay. <laughs> I mean, my, <laughs> find you. This was months ago. This was what November, right after Fractals yeah. came. Oh, I was, I was just wondering if there's like if that was supposed to be there because that was weird, and I so wish I'd uh, taken I some screenshots. <laughs> I'll ask the map artist about it. <laughs> did, did you jokingly add a like a Valhalla looking place at the bottom if people fell off the edge? <laughs> yeah. Before we move on, I do have one quick question, which is um a lot of the new content we've been seeing has been in instant zones of like outside of a little bit of the frame, flame and frost stuff. But, like the major content pieces have been inside instant zone. And as like an environment designer, do you see any advantages or disadvantages? when you're creating something in an instant zone compared to something you're creating in the actual world? Like, are there some difficulties you obviously would come across while making that instant zone than you would, you know, crafting the existing world? Uh, give me an example. Um, I guess an example is I, um, the super adventure box would be an extreme example because yeah. there would be no way it would be extremely hard to implement that into the in-game world, but something like, I guess, dungeons, that we're seeing um, recently with the I flame and frost things would be like not so much the dungeon, but I guess in the north of Wayfair, there's Brom. I think yeah, like his instance is sort of it, it's on the map, but it's sort of an instance area. Oh, I got you. Yeah, so or, would it be or, where, where Box it? takes you into the hatchery and uh, rain. yeah, yeah, that's another good example. Plateau, yeah. Um, I I don't think there's a significant difference except that. Uh, with fewer players, we have a little more resources to work with. 
right, um, right. as far as you know polygons we can jam on the screen and stuff like that mm -hmm. okay cool makes sense because that way if if you're going to be okay this is going to be for this specific you know storyline want to make it as i guess flushed out as you can Right. Um, so that we don't have to worry about, you know, hundreds of people storming in and crazy frame rate issues and everything like right. that. Right. Yeah. There's well, no giant Is there any, like, crabs. the server side stuff that you have to worry about when it comes to stuff like Super Venture Box and other instances? Like, do you only have so much server space or anything like that? Uh, there's definitely technical concerns. I mean, I, I think I brought this up last time when we made the Mad King Clock Tower. I was under the impression everyone would be able to play it solo, <laughs> and that wasn't true. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think what happens is we let the server team know several months ahead of time what we're planning, and they tell us what can be done and what can't be done. And that they can kind of jigger stuff around to, to make room for certain things at certain times. I, I don't know all the technicalities. Yeah. And that was, like, one of the crazy things because um, I, I was actually – wanting to go into super venture box with just me and noob because we hadn't done before and we had to actually rope we'd in a just get guys. lost and then we'd quit that's well, what it was, would, yeah that was but why would you ever think that's a good idea well, because uh, we had to rope in dudes who hadn't done, who had already done it before us and they had to do it in infantile mode with us um and, right. and i still got lost and how, you still how lost. of a gamer i am so you needed more pointing fingers <laughs> yes i need someone to I, I, there needs to be a follow command that i can always press and it goes to my nearest party member <laughs> It goes to the nearest cloud that you know, <laughs> yes, the nearest yeah. teleports me. In fact, oh man, or just put like the Skyrim arrow in. in oh in the yeah, so the noob can never get lost. Were those clouds supposed to look like they were pooping out the rainbow, or was that just like, are they po are they in fact pooping out the rainbow, or? We, we went through a couple a couple uh, ideations of them where you know, do we want them to vomit the rainbow? Do we want them to? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think what we ended up with was was the best. It the little <laughs> kind of a struggle and squeeze. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. But man, they look souped when they're doing that. They, they are so excited. They're so happy. Yep, they're awesome. Well, now we will move on to the I guess last segment of really just out there questions. We didn't really know where to place these. So, yeah. Shimboy. I guess the one, the one that I have marked first, I'm going to ask last because we will have time for it. And that, that's a good yeah. final question, I think. Anyway, um, the first one um, is from Wooden Potatoes. Um, everyone on the show uh, seems to know who he is. But for listeners at home, um, he runs a highly entertaining and fairly popular uh, Guild Wars 2 YouTube channel. Um, I had some correspondence with him regarding our last show. So before this one, I asked him if he had any questions that he would like to ask. Yeah, he's, he, he's actually pretty popular among the developers, too. Cool. Oh, there you go. Is he bigger than us, Shin Boy? <laughs> yes, he's probably. multiples of I'm our size. I'm guessing yes. <laughs> he clean, um, he, he's a bit more cleaned up than we are. That's yeah, he asked this question, and when he asked me this question, you'll see it in a little while, but I didn't know this existed even until he mentioned it. But um, Josh, you apparently mentioned specific. that there's a little gold coin you can see in Lion's Arch near the trading post, which I believe has um, your little insignia on it. And what Wooden Potatoes wanted to know was obviously shows that you guys want players to explore and go out of the way. And if they do, there are cool things there for them to find. Um, and he wants to know if you can elaborate on exactly how many of those coins are out there. Cause what he mentioned to me was that he would like to do a big community event where he goes, okay, there's, you know, say 10 of these coins, go find them all and come back to me. And then you, you know, win a prize or whoever finds them all. So, how yeah. many coins? Uh. He's just, I, I, wish, I wish either. I knew. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that that was something that I I put into just little nooks and crannies or places where I felt like it, most of the time there would be a world out bug, right? And I would say, wow, that's really cool that you can get up there. And I would fix the bug, but still allow you to get up to some weird, awkward place. And I just <laughs> wanted to say, kind of put a little <laughs> note on there and say, hey, that's cool. I'm glad you got here, guys. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's yeah, I wouldn't say it's a reward, but it, it's more like like some kind of communication from the developer to the player, saying you know, hey, you're cool. Nice. Um, I don't think there's more than like three or four, and I honestly can't remember uh, where they are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's guess see what he does four, with that. <laughs> for the yeah. earlier discussion. Oh, of... sorry. I wish I could give you more. 
<laughs> well, no, it's it's for the earlier discussion of like, do you choose like the explore? Like, do you cater to the explorable crowd or the the uh, crowd that wants the reward? You are sort of a catering to the group that likes to explore, and the reward is finding that little tidbit that lets them know they're like the, the like, hey, you found a connection with the the developer. He yeah. he knows you. You were here, and that's that's kind of awesome. I think. Yeah, that's that's how I feel about it. Because honestly, until he mentioned it to me in that question, I didn't even know that the coin and lines arch even existed. Yeah. Right. So I have to go try and find it. Right. Okay. Um. Let's see. There you go, wooden potatoes. How about yeah, those? there you go. <laughs> potatoes. <laughs> oh, burn. <laughs> I hate you. And anyway, moving on. Um, Blitz, um, he is a member of uh, our guild as well as the Giant Bomb forums. Um, and he wanted to know if – I'll try and reword it because it's kind of confusing wording. Um. Have you ever had an issue where you couldn't fit an event in due to either like engine limitations or restrictions on how you design the open world or or anything like that? Like did did Uh, the design ever limit the content or did the content ever limit the design or anything like that? Yeah, that's, that's the canvas that game developers paint on, right? You're always running into limitations and figuring out how do we, create the kind of experiences you want to given the limitations we have. And you know, like I brought up with Super Adventure Box, I mean, that whole idea came about because I found a way to, you know, get around the limitations of having a giant open environment. You know, there's, there's still a lot of them intrinsic with having from one to five players, and so there's all those other limitations to deal with. But it's, it's a different kind of experience that we're able to create. Um, and... So basically every, every different kind of flavor that we can get into Guild Wars 2 has its pluses and minuses that, you know, you just deal with as a developer. Right. Okay, because I guess his follow-up to that would be um, you mentioned like sort of getting rid of limitations by sort of zoning things off and, and all of that. He was wondering if there was any way, just for him personally, if there was any way you could fit like sort of like a multi-event sort of horde mode into like one of the guild missions or something like that, where you might have to design its own environment, but because you're designing its own environment, you could sort of, I don't know how to phrase this, um, sort of add more game modes to the open world as opposed to just a normal defend event or, or uh, escort event or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so be, because we have our living world teams, like I was talking about before, and they're kind of given, you know, a blank check and said, you know, fill fill this up with something interesting. Um, we're always exploring those those avenues, and and we're so much more familiar now with the tool set that we have and with the ramifications of the decisions we made, you know, five years ago. Right. And so we're able to make better decisions now. We're able to to build on on what worked really well. And, and yeah, and so finding different, different facets, different avenues of creating unique experiences, that's, that's what we're going to be doing over the next however many years. Cool. Okay. That's interesting. Are the only ones and from the other kind of vague, but, but I mean, it, it's kind of a vague question, right? It's like, it would, will we make more new interesting things? And the answer is yes. <laughs> okay. And, and it seems like the way you described it, that you guys have sort of figured out a way um, to make an environment to fit those things into, which is good. Yeah. Shinboy, okay, I have a couple um, questions before we get to the joke questions. So, I can I just ask my actual the, the one that says bonus because we do have time. Oh yeah, no, that's, that's, actually, we have plenty yeah. of time. So just go ahead. Okay. Um, we have another three days. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, you had mentioned before about how like your um, pixely sword idea got shot down. Um, and I was wondering if in any game, whether it be uh, Guild Wars 2 or any other – or the original Guild Wars or any other games you've worked on, um, if there was anything that you sort of like poured your heart and soul into and just sort of got it shot down because of that reason, oh, it doesn't fit in our world or anything like that. And you were just totally bummed that you love this thing, but it wouldn't work. <laughs> um, yeah, every now and then. I, most of the time – when you're just brainstorming and you have a random idea, you kind of get a sense for if it's going to fit in the, you know, the, the biosphere of, of the game experience. Um, the, there's one particular one that happened a uh, long time ago when I was working on Descent 3. <laughs> and I had this idea for these, for these alien catacombs that you would fly through with these kind of mummified 
uh, alien corpses in, in niches along the walls and alien ghosts basically would be the, the enemy. I, I can't even remember all the details, but you know, I was so excited about it and wanted to make it and no one liked the idea. And they said, no, it's, that's not our game. <laughs> that is the exact kind of answer I was looking for. <laughs> Um, um, so, Cynic, you had, you had another question before I, we get to I, I, the, I the ultimatum question. I have a couple. I, and I also think we should Please. do the inverse Q&A like we did last time. Um, okay. So, all right. My first question was, so, Josh, you were obviously around during the betas. Do you remember the Hunger Games event? Yeah. Um, so, we, we replayed that, and I, I, I'm not, I bet we could probably go back to some of the podcasts we did around then. That was one of the coolest things that we've seen, we saw ever. I'd say yeah. the only things that are up there would be Super Venture Box and some of like the, the Snowblind Fractal are as good oh, as... I remember the first time playing that. Oh, yeah. God. Um, so that would that just like are the upper echelons of what we've experienced in Guild Wars 2, whether that says good things or bad. But um, had are there any more plans for like events like that just crazy almost like doom total conversion-esque stuff to do in short over like short durations for gear wars 2 because that was amazing um i can't say anything specific but i can tell you for sure that uh hunger games idea has not been forgotten <laughs> and that Ooh, oh i can just feel <laughs> regina's glare just staring us all down <laughs> through the internet uh, I, I guess another way to word it is for doing a Hunger Games thing. I'm just saying that lots of people <laughs> loved it and lots of people uh, would like to revisit it. And yeah, you know, happens will happen. We don't know. Sometime <laughs> along the road, Guild Wars Two will have an event. That is what he's saying. <laughs> Maybe have an event. No, because that, that's kind of like it was one along the lines of many events Arena has held in the past. Like for example, at the end of the Guild Wars One beaters, you had the whole thing with. Um, enemies attacking people whilst they were in lion's arch and they couldn't fight back and stuff like that which are just like crazy world events that are like because my our understanding was um back when that hunger games thing was done apparently like the there was some dev interviews at the time which was like you guys only spent like two days or so and so forth making yeah. that event um it just like strikes me as such a, a cool opportunity for stuff to put into, especially in, in, on along the lines of um, giving players a reason to return on a monthly basis. Um, are there any plans for like other events like that kind of stuff, or like is that something well, you guys are looking at? You're talking about two different things. I mean, the the world ending ones where it's like, okay, we're about to shut down the server because beta's over. You know, <laughs> that, that's just kind of a no brainer. Well, how are we going to kick everyone out? Let's do it with some kind of style, right? Okay, right. Um, and that so no, I mean we can't just kill everyone randomly anymore. <laughs> oh man, that would Aww. be the best. That would be it's the almost best. Like that, it's almost like in in movies you see like you know they make the excellent line or they do like you know they they know the right time to to punch the bad guy. But yeah. in, in real life, if you make that line, there's the really awkward time after that when. It's like with credits would normally be rolling. That's when you guys are staring at each other and he's like, you have to walk away. But, but that would be really <laughs> cool. Like being at like near the end of a dungeon and then like a developer comes into a dungeon and just kills you. I'd love to see <laughs> stuff like that. But even like alternative stuff, which would be like um, in some areas of the game, there aren't any particular story stuff that I can remember. Like um, what's that? Harathi Hinterlands. Is there any, any story stuff there, Shinboy, that I know of? There's no? in terms of personal story, not that I went through, yeah. but there's that really neat um meta event up north right but i just like there's no you, cross the you story have to struggle stuff against there. centaur and humans and centaur will always push you back yeah but like there's there's that uh well, I, I actually agree that that stuff is pretty cool but um because there's no cross the story stuff though there is like a opportunity for that area to be used in like okay for this month or no for this like two week period we will have a reimagining of that um zombie apocalypse event which he did, guys, doing doing the Vitas, which was freaking awesome with the whole taking over what? and players becoming enemies. Oh yes, um, and then like if you get attacked by a centaur, you become a centaur and you like grow. Is that what you're trying to say, oh, or am any, I just anything? It, it, really matter, it doesn't really matter. It's like crazy events like that to happen again, like beta equivalent events to happen again in these comparatively unused or underused areas. Uh, 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 
I guess uh, another way to word it is with the uh, Karka event, uh, <laughs> you guys definitely understood that it's uh, there is going to be some requirements for server stability and all that, yeah. and maybe not the best way to do giant open world combat. Right. But possibly in future living story events, you guys might bring out uh, some sort of zone wide event to help out. Like that—that mm-hmm. that is something that is on the table. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I have, but specifically, I want crazy. <laughs> Like I, off the wall. You can't always have crazy I, I You're too. Crazy. You're, you're. You need to be put on a leash. But <laughs> we can't have crazy, yet, crazy questions. Leash. But I guess before we do that, do we want to do the reverse QA. Yeah, I, I can only tell you that the amount of craziness that we're officially allowed to do is seventy-three. So. <laughs> we we require over nine thousand craziness. I'm is sorry. that metric or imperial? <laughs> Definitely imperial. Oh, come on, oh, this I, is the U.S. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Wait for me. Not you can take the reins back. All right. Uh, I guess uh, before we do silly questions, yeah. do you have any questions that you want to ask us? Um. Let's see. What did I ask last time? I think I just asked like, what was a good experience that you had yeah. in the game? Yeah. Um. Well, I I guess since I we're going forward with another uh, world for Super Adventure Box, like mm-hmm. what what kind of old tropes from old games would you guys like to see? What what was cool about the first one? What would you like to see going forward to the second? Are, are you planning no. to stick within the platformer genre, or you you guys want to branch out into like RPG and stuff? Um, we're, well, we're we're action and we're like platform adventure, right? Okay. So Mario meets Zelda is right. is kind of where. We're at. So I guess I'll start off. RPG. It's it's something that some people will probably groan upon hearing, but I. As a kid, I uh, like the uh, the uh, Legends of Zelda: Ocarina of Time, like the whole uh, uh, Pong battle back and forth, both in the the Forest Temple and at the very end when you fight Ganon. Um, it would be kind of cool if the players had to like get in a, a circle or at least get like you know spread out some. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be dependent on if you're by yourself or with a full group, but you have to do this whole boomerang fight with uh, like the frog king's prince or some boss but like that would be a cool thing and then like you're constantly having to look back and forth to see where the hot potato's at mm-hmm. good answer I, I mean, there I, already is something similar to that if you go to in the human star zone and there's that one heart the renowned heart where you can you have to like train with the troops if you pick up the shield there's the npc who sort of jumps around and you have to wait for him to jump at you and time your block so that that could sort of, I guess, I could see how that would work in that sort of setting. Yeah. I mean, you have all the players get around in a circle, and you have to, you know, bounce the the ball back at a certain time. That could be interesting. For me, okay. it's, you kind of so, hit the the nail on the head of it when you started that sentence. Temples, god damn it! <laughs> 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 like what? Uh, he like um, it's hard because puzzle solving is really difficult in team circumstances. Like I, I Zelda wouldn't work as a multiplayer game. I I don't think, but. A, I don't know. They made one. Yeah, <sighs> they made the Four Swords Adventure. Yeah, did it we, work? We at Four Swords <laughs> yeah. a lot. Yeah. Like, so, are you guys planning to do like group pu- like a temple, a group puzzle solving kind of thing? Well, our last world is castle, and that's going to kind of be most of the the temple oriented tropes. Right. Wait, oh, <laughs> no, was Four right. Swords was Four Swords the one where you hooked the four GBAs up to the GameCube? Is that how? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure I had the right one in mind. <laughs> The one that nobody played. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's such a hard design challenge to make something that's engaging for one to, you know, yeah. four players, or in our case, one to five mm-hmm. players. Right. There are crazy amounts of weird, uh, just design logic that has to go on. Yeah. And the other would be, like, mini-bosses, right? That's another huge element of... So I know that there, there was stuff at the end of each, like, subsection for... One one for Super Venture Box, but I didn't yeah, remember the, the, the B Dog Queen. Yeah, yeah those were our mini bosses for World One. We'll have more engaging ones. Yeah, I was gonna say because like the whole thing about Zelda is like you get the the X implement and you use that to beat the next boss, and I, I kind of can't wait to see what you do with that going forward. It's gonna be cool. I guess uh, it with all like, did you guys plan like look into anything with like Mega Man, like the way the the jump system works with that of moving platforms, or is that still something that is like not possible with the current uh, engine of Guild Wars Two? Uh, it, it's something that, that we're looking into and trying to figure out how much we can get away with. 
I've suggested two things. Come on, guys. Okay, I'll go with one. <laughs> um, since we touched on it earlier, and you mentioned the castle and the dungeons, um, messing with the lighting more because when when you have, um, I guess, an indoor setting or a partially indoor setting like a castle, you can sort of manipulate the lighting and the way things look um, much more so than you can with an outdoor thing where you're like, okay, it's either sunny or it's dark. That's about it. Um, so I like to see you know messing with the lighting more. I guess more character interaction, like humorous character interaction. I know, uh, I know, it's hard yeah. to like just randomly make stuff like that, but it is oh, definitely. Oh no, my rewarding. cut. Yeah, <laughs> for someone, for someone like, especially if you're just like a content tourist, like me or cynic, mm-hmm. and you're just going around seeing the content, it is especially rewarding to see, you know, a lot of that sort of funny stuff. Definitely yeah. keeps people coming back. I think the dialogue was some of the best stuff in Super Adventure Box, like easily. Yeah, so, so or, or the shopkeeper who yeah didn't care when you threw stuff away. <laughs> yeah, the best. So cool. Oh, that was great. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess yeah, I, I, was I was probably really saying, exercising like... my, my writing chops there. I was thinking <laughs> <laughs> back to how, how 8 bit characters talk to you and <laughs> translate to one. <laughs> but we actually um, we, we had a lot of our English edited away though, sadly. But... Oh no. Oh. That would have been perfect. Oh. Wait, was it was it deemed offensive or was it just like, oh it's a bit much? Uh, <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure exactly. I mean the the, the <laughs> editors have their own code of of you know what's what's acceptable inside Gilbert. ethics code and uh yeah so i mean that, uh, i mean getting back to the like like things you can't put in the game sort of thing yeah you know i created a festivus poll i don't know if any of you guys are familiar <laughs> oh yes i know what you're talking about festivus for the rest of us right yeah, yeah and and you know there's a little uh, we made a little asura that looks just like frank costanza and I wrote some lines that were like just sideways enough where it, you know, it, it were it was lines from Seinfeld, but it was translated into, you know, what a what a Crichton, uh, a Surin would say. <laughs> and um, yeah, they, they it just didn't go. The monsters. It's it oh, yeah. a shame. See, so and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's for a good cause. I mean, you can't have a game that's nothing but references to other things or you end up with Family Guy the game. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, Borderlands too. Still, <laughs> I, I I want my Costanza Sura. I, I, no, I, I'm with I'm with Josh. I think Josh thinks the way I do when it comes to a little bit. Now crazier. you have to make an Asura called Costanza Sura. It oh. flows well as one word. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, Shinboy. Uh, oh yes. Um, did you happen to Josh? Uh, did you happen to nab the name Soiled Underplants at launch, or did you come up with that later? I did get it at launch, yeah. Oh, because I saw that and I was like, oh man, that's a pretty good pun. <laughs> Worst. All right, Worst. Uh, New Brahma or Dirt, you got any ideas? D- the dialogue, I told you. God. No. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, I, I, I'm like trying to think of things, but honestly, like I was already kind of blown away when we found the warp fish. So <laughs> was that was worm, probably like the best it? thing I could have found. The worm. Or was it worm? That's right, it was worm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, like that was that was probably like the best, like, retro game callback that I could have ever seen in this thing. So I'm I'm pretty happy with what I've gotten already. Konami code somehow. No, I'm, yeah, I'm good. I, I think you guys are doing a really cool thing. And I bet what you are thinking of is probably more interesting than what we're thinking yes. of for that. So <laughs> I, I totally can't wait. All right. Hence so if you don't get paid to make games. Yep. In now fact, we're, I think we're, we're losing now we delve money into the, the dark part, uh, dark section of just... Well, really, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to start playing questions. Dark Sector? Josh, well, I guess, Josh questions? any other questions for us, sir? Or no, no, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right, now we just asked these really dumb questions. Okay, Josh. I want to ask my first. <laughs> I want to ask my first. Okay, these are, these are like the uh, the personality part sections of uh, applications. Yeah, <laughs> pretty exactly. much. This is more, this is more of a uh, a reference question, I suppose. You worked on a game called Alter Echo. Also yep. working on this game, uh, I believe he was a gameplay programmer. Programmer, programmer. What was um, Mr. man that we all adore by the name of Brad Mir? He is adorable. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like working with Mr. Brad Mir? <laughs> it was good. He's a super awesome guy. Um, he he plays in a ska band, or well, at least he did when I, when yep. I worked with him. Yeah, and that was a good five years after ska was out. So <laughs> I, I hope he's still. Um, <laughs> no, he's just a super chill, really yeah. nice guy. I love him. He's Mr. Muir yeah, on um, M00 
O E E R on Twitter. So he's the best. Yeah, because because we yeah. are we're, we're the the giant bomb. We're all members of the giant bomb community, and he he is good friends with with all those guys. So we see him all the time. Yeah, on uh, on videos and live shows and stuff. So we have all grown to love Brad Muir. Also, yeah. I think they played the behind the scenes making of for Alter Echo on yes, one of his did. live streams. And I think I'm pretty sure that was Josh that Foreman. I, I swear I, it, was, was it was actually like they, they played they played the credits. The credits. We, we, we saw your name on the credits. That's how we made the connection. Right. Oh, okay. But wasn't he in that thing? I think he was in that video, wasn't no, he? No, Brad no. Brad Muir was in that thing. Only Brad Muir and some other dudes? All right. Yeah. <sighs> anyway. Yeah. Was that, was that your question? All right. Yes, because I, I would have, man, I would have remembered if we saw Alter Echo era Josh Foreman and I would have linked that picture in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Regardless Alter of its Echo quality. Was such a sad story, man. That, that game had so much promise and so many like cool, unique <laughs> features for its time, and just completely botched by THQ. Oh, you know what? And now they're on, dead. I, I mean, it honestly were... looked really interesting. Like when when Brad because they were playing it on the show uh, while was, Brad was, was talking after, about it. After THQ, it was and, like their THQ in memorium thing, yeah, if I recall. Yeah. yeah. Um, and like. It, it like like you said like it looked like something that like definitely had a lot of promise to it and everything so it's it's I was kind of sad because I had literally never heard of the game prior to that show. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, it's like THQ did everything they could to sabotage its release. It is it, horror story after horror story, but and well, and, and then they let us all go. But right. uh, the the thing that I think really kind of final nail in the coffin was just the art style was un, unapproachable. Like it was super unique and super interesting and i love it but no one could tell where they were or what they were doing (laughs) that's possible i i I, it seems like it seems like it it was good from from an artistic standpoint and was certainly unique but it it seemed like it might have been a bit difficult to market yeah it, it definitely was like it didn't have you know you're in the warehouse now or you're in the tower now or you're in the forest it was all just like you're, you're inside in the, the VR guts place. of an alien planet the whole time yeah well the whole planet is this plant thing that is sentient and it's it makes sense but yeah, yeah. Cool. It, was, it was a cool design uh but i guess moving on to cynics yeah dumb question yeah my dumb question of this time around all right so when eating well, is it specific buffalo wings is that what we're settling on no, we well this all go... started this all started with kfc okay is it, it, KF... it kfc i thought yeah, because KFC said they were going to do boneless stuff, and that's okay. how this whole thing started. Well, there you go. Um, so when eating wings, there is two ways of eating them, of which one is correct, and the other one is, is, is sorely wasteful and horrible. Um, if you were to choose, Josh Foreman, between chicken that had the bone still in it or boneless chicken for your wings, which would you choose? I know it's the wrong answer, but it's the boneless. No, no that's yes. the right answer. That's yes, the right that's answer. Right. <laughs> yes. Oh, it is? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Internet high Because you're not a savage. Yeah. <laughs> why Why would you want something that hard to eat? Like, <laughs> I, I don't understand. You're trying to enjoy your food. Exactly. I don't, I don't well, this, I, mean, like, this is I can eat boneless chicken wings with a fork. Yeah. yeah like exactly. a civilized human being. I can do other things <laughs> while while – Consuming that food, yeah. Like, Not actually, that I, I use do. chopsticks, so it's okay for me. Yeah, actually, food that I have to eat with my hands really annoys me because I'm always multitasking. Right. And yeah. yeah, when I I'm have to dedicate way. myself to eating, it's just an annoyance. Mm-hmm. Also, I feel like there's like some sort of compulsive need to wash my hands before I eat with anything with my hands. And if, if mm-hmm. I don't that's have, that's probably you know, a smart idea to wash your hands before you stick your hands in your mouth. Yeah. Also, I can do things <laughs> like put... for me. It's it's more so a problem of like. The compulsive need to wash my hands while I'm eating things with my hands. That's true. Oh, yeah. Like, but even you, if you clearly, it doesn't really matter. You just, it feels gross having grease yeah. all over your hands. But you can put, well, I did. I, you can put things like boneless chicken in, like, between bread and do other stuff with it. So I like, oh, yeah. I, suddenly you have a sandwich. Yeah, suddenly you have a sandwich. has been improved. Yeah, it's just, it's just so much better in every way. God damn it. Well done, sir. Josh Foreman. I will think applaud the industrial you. revolution. Pass the the test. Test. Well, correct. <laughs> yes. You passed you pass the team boneless test. The giant bomb test. Making a seal of approval. Yep. Is that it for the week? Are we done? Uh, I've, I have one really just grown one, but uh, would you rather fight a duck-sized char or 
No, it would you rather fight a char-sized duck or ten duck-sized char? Uh-huh. Char-sized duck. Yep. Char have teeth. Or, or ten so I, duck-sized so a six, char. So a seven-foot-tall duck. Or, Man, that sounds frightening. <laughs> yeah. Or <laughs> ten one-foot-tall char. Mind you, when I'm imagining the duck, I'm not ma- imagining like an actual duck. I'm just imagining a giant like rubber ducky. <laughs> Oh, like eight still ducks. Tall. That would that would be terrible. I mean, ducks are <laughs> vicious. Yeah, they are. They can be mean. Thing about their how they mate, it's terrible. What? How, uh, what's the thing about how no, they mate? No, no, we, I don't know sure if we want to go down this road. No, I want to know what's happening. <laughs> it's a dark road. I'll explain it. I'll explain <laughs> later. I'll tell you what you're on Wikipedia. I've got to crack dot com and type in duck, and you'll find it. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you. There. Yeah, I do. The, I would do the duck. Size char. Wait, how many of them are there? Ten. Uh, ten. <laughs> enough to enough to like throw you on the ground, sort of thing. Yeah. And and they put up a fight. Out, your jugular would be yeah. Uh, I guess the char sized duck. <laughs> yeah, I would go for the char sized duck. I think that's. I think you're crazy. I, I I think you can kick a small char like pretty hard. Like you can probably yeah, disable but, but them with your a kick. Ankles and... But that's the same with like rabbit has, dogs. Uh, yeah, like, I'm to... thinking like. According Ducks to modern science, are basically like gremlins. Yeah, yeah. That, that is you true. But according to modern science, he has picked the right choice because the, at that size, the duck's legs won't be ah. able to hold itself. Oh come on! Get <laughs> out of here. Hold on. That's what I'm counting on. Just so it just, it just, yeah, legs crush. Um, it's a new drama during. Do you guys have anything dumb to ask? Um, me? If, if you could <laughs> own any THQ property, what would you own? Ooh, that's not. That's an awesome question. Uh, so oh, THQ. as in like a, a game property? Uh, anything, really, yeah. Not, not real estate? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, not real estate. <laughs> any, any IP, I guess. <laughs> uh, all the things that I keep thinking of, they don't actually own. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, guess, I guess Red Faction, uh, yeah. when, I, when I first started, um, sorry, I didn't work on Red Faction, the, the first one when they, when they started making it, it was our sister company, Volition. And, uh, but, but they were a sister company, so we shared news groups, so we were all buddy buddy, right? And when they first started it, they had something so cool going, and then they turned it into a linear first person shooter, <laughs> which completely like ruined their cool new tech. Yeah, so I don't know. All, all my it, memories are of playing the multiplayer of it and then just like shooting a hole in a wall just like 50 mm-hmm. times to making a hallway. And then just running through there instead of the hallway right next to it. I would just camp in that hallway. Yeah, yeah. That's like all my memories of Red Faction too. So that yeah, I, I would I would I would want to reboot Red Faction. But they kind of did that with Gorilla, you, right? Josh. Gorilla was amazing. Gorilla. Yeah, oh, it was cool. Um, I just I I <laughs> want to be able to dig down through the terrain. Yeah, the problem <laughs> with Gorilla like it was cool, but it took the the idea of geo modding. And instead of actually like modifying the terrain, you were just able to destroy buildings. So like it'd be cool to maybe have all of that to, to be able to destroy those buildings, but also be able to put holes in the camera. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. Uh, Dirt, do you, uh, do you have any question to round, round us out, or should we just go to plugs? I, no, I think we can go to plugs. I think we we have filled our quota of dumb questions. Yep. Very cool. All right. Um, I guess starting off with Josh, uh, how is that? Like, uh, did any other plug? Like, any plugs from you, or uh, just keep plugging that? Um, project on youtube how how's that going along oh it's still coming i'm uh i'm in the middle of making a uh, four foot tall uh colossus from shadow of the colossus oh, wow. awesome it. like wait any particular uh, one yeah which did you choose yeah it's the it's the sixth one the uh barba the one with the big beard oh okay nice mm. i'm throwing my beard out at the same time that i'm sculpting it i, I started in november i think <laughs> and i still only have maybe Four inches, maybe three, four inches of beard. So it's pretty sad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, so. it was it was pretty impressive during the um, what, whatever that horrible internet song was that you rocked out oh, on with the Harlem Shake video. Harlem yeah. Shake, oh god, <laughs> that was that, terrible. <laughs> you being on there was the one bright moment of just like, oh no, Renet's doing. Oh wait, that's Josh Foreman. Yes, <laughs> oh, and I, then I, there was. I had not that. heard of that meme. Uh, before they were say, they were like, "Hey, let's all get together and do this thing." I was like, oh, "It's a camera, and I can be stupid in front of a camera. I'll do it." Yay! And then I found out it was uh, yeah. whatever. Some people liked it. That's good. 
It was pretty funny. I chuckled. Yeah. I'm bringing up that video now. Very cool. Uh, so, uh, like, as far just, as just... plugs, I'm not. I don't. Yeah, I don't have anything really new. The, the only thing I would have um, that people might enjoy checking out, just if they like Super Venture Box and old school games, is uh, they could check out uh, some of my sculptures. Where I've been uh, re envisioning some of the original uh, Zelda monsters and stuff. So you could check that out at uh, scribe.deviantart.com. And the, the scribe is spelled with a Y, so it's S C R Y B E. Dot deviantart dot com. I'll put that That's in the show notes. Mm. It'll be in the show notes. Yeah. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> moving on to Shimboy. Um, I finished Far Cry Three Blood Dragon, so probably tomorrow afternoon. I pretty much don't have anything to do, so I will be writing up a review for that. Um, and that'll go on my uh, my blog, pluginplaygaming dot com. Um. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, when are you going I back still, to them Hearts? Uh, now that I don't know, because I really there are no games coming out that I really feel like I need to play, and I'm probably not going to restart Mass Effect for a while, seeing as my save got botched, and I don't feel like replaying that beginning. Um, so probably soon, unless you want to finish um, Saints Row the Third, because then we could do that. Oh right, we need to do that. Yeah. Just to okay. be clear. Josh Foreman is a dude wearing the Zelda themed t shirt who is suggestively riding the guy with the horse mask. <laughs> that tells you all you need to know about this video, really. They, they said he could do whatever he wanted. <laughs> well, as a secondary note, my favorite, my other favorite thing so about weird. that video is I believe it's on the left. There's a guy with like a YOLO hat on just shaking his head in shame. Yeah, so that, that was Byron. <laughs> he, was our, he was our QA guy on. Uh... On Super Adventure Box. Who was the guy wearing the char yeah, mask? The, the guy who opened the video. Oh, I don't even remember. Oh. It, it was whoever had the smallest head because the mask <laughs> shrank over the past year or whatever. Nice. <laughs> oh, wow. Man, this that's is just the, this that sounds like a thing that shouldn't happen. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. Um, Cynic, do you have any plugs? Um, so there's a video with Josh Foreman in it, and I'm going to put it in the show notes. It's called Harlem Shake. I don't know. Something happened a couple years ago, but you can see it there. Um, (laughs) Oh, is that the Psy thing? The Korean dude? No. No. (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) Um, no, aside from that, not really. I, I, hmm. No, I don't, yeah. I I, I could plug PlayStation Plus, which I'm looking at for. I'm really, really staring at it at the moment, because I, I found a 750 gig hard drive on my desk. Essentially, you know, just found it, just showed up. Well, yeah, I just forgot about it. And now it's here, and I'm putting in my PS3 this afternoon. And I might sort of sign up for PlayStation Plus because you can get Catherine. But I mentioned that last week. Sort last of, week. sort of serious question. Does the <clears throat> PS3 take um, three and a half inch drives or two and a half? It's a laptop, so two and a half. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious. Yeah. That thing's not that big for a three and a half inch drive. Yeah, no, it's, it's totally spaced that I had this hard drive. So now I can fit Infamous 2. So that'll be on there. And it's New Rama, what plug. plugs do you have? Um, before I do my plug, <laughs> so, I sleep, I Josh, I, I went I went to your channel to look up your video project real quick, and, I, and I, found, oh. I found a popular oh. video called Your Money or the Stairs, and I'm very curious <laughs> on what this is about. <laughs> uh, that was about, um, wow, it's nine years old at this point. Yep, uh, man. Yeah, so that that's Tammy. She's another one of the environment artists here. And one of our coworkers got a new camera and he was like, hey, it can take video. Check this out. So it's like, oh, okay, I got this idea. <laughs> so that's what we did. I, I, I suggest everyone to check this out. You should link this on the uh, in the show notes. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm this is very look, extensive stuff. Almost work. as yeah. if it were a plug. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, wait. <laughs> Durin, wait, do you have wait, any plug? Oh, all right. Yeah, is this you flexing your pecs? Is that, is that, <laughs> is that you? <laughs> I should yeah, so. that was in response to someone that needed that. Needed that. <laughs> oh, man. I might have to watch this video now. <laughs> it's so weird. It's so weird. Uh, yeah, those are going to be all in the show notes. Um, PC Gaming Hub. We're all playing that gross Neverwinter game. Except me. Come hang out with me. Add me on Facebook. Join mm-hmm. the Facebook group. Please don't join the back. Facebook don't, group. Don't join the Facebook group. Yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta get on, like I've been reading my my son a bunch of uh, like um who's the who's the guy who writes all the Drizzt novels? Oh uh, fuck! I heard, yeah, I forgot his name. I know that guy. That I guy, know someone who would know that, but that person is not on the show. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, my son's really interested in checking out that game. And 
Because he can be a dark elf. So cool. <laughs> R.A. Salvatore. Yeah, that's the guy. Yeah. That name sounds familiar. It does sound. Wait, how, how old is your son? Is, is he... You got two, don't you? Yeah, uh, it's my 13-year-old. Okay, so that's fine. You could probably play online games as 13, right? Or is that something you'd probably frown upon? No, that's, that's fine. Yeah, that's probably fine. I remember getting bullied on the internet for having a high voice when I was 13. You still get bullied on the internet for having I, a high I still voice. Get bullied and you're on barely Durin, over 13. What, yeah. Durin, what plugs do you have? Um, I, I don't know a specific time because Shimboy and I will have to sort that out, but I will totally be streaming us going through Saints Row the Third co op. Are we going to um, restart like from the beginning? <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. We can. Because we're at like varying points. Yeah. Yeah, we can restart. Okay. I'll pick the zombie I feel voice. Guilty. Just I still haven't played that game, even though I have like 10 friends who worked on it. Oh. <laughs> That's true, because Volition. Um, uh, yeah. A bunch of us from Outrage ended up there after THQ has closed us. It's a really good game. Definitely recommend yeah, it. Because like we were both like halfway through and sort of in like that game for us was in limbo of like, yeah, we'll get to it eventually. And then they announced um, Saints Row 4 and we're both just like, oh man, we should Saints probably Street finish 5. it. <laughs> oh, burn. New Brahma with the they announced, They released that uh, that footage that I got to see at PAX. Um, nice. Yeah, they did. The other day. Demo. Yeah, I guess I guess that'll be my plug. Uh, I, I plugged the Twitch, but I mean, the only game I'll be playing in the future apart from Guild Wars is like Metro Last Light, mm-hmm. which... It's an awesome game. I suggest people check it out, but it's kind of weird to stream a single-player like, story game. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's at just giantbomb.com. It's a website about video games, <laughs> sort of like IGN or something, but in a much more awesome way. Mm-hmm. Check it out. Yeah, we, and... we really sold that. We sold that so hard. We, we if you like to see, heart and soul like to see it. entertaining personalities play really dumb video games, yep. join the Pizza Gaming Hub. <laughs> Go on to that bad. Uh, right, I, I want to say a huge thanks no, to please. Regina for helping yeah. us set this up. She's still is she still there? She might be asleep. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I to- totally right, wanted to say you. hi on the show, but whatever. All right, cool. <laughs> thank you, Josh Foreman, for coming back uh, with on the Linking Cast. Uh, I'm not sure why, but you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Step two of our plan. <laughs> what? The, the only thing I wish we'd, we'd asked is what movies and shit Josh has been watching recently. Oh, we could just talk about that now. Yeah. What, what have you been watching, Josh? Um, I think just the latest blockbusters, Iron Man 3, Oblivion. How'd you like Iron Man? I liked it. It was good. Because I didn't the like the first two. I, I don't like, expect much out of superhero movies, so when I'm <laughs> when I like them, I'm pleasantly surprised. Nice. Mm. Yeah, I thought, there's I thought one it was thing I, I pretty much look, as good uh, as yeah, the first one. Th- no, there's one thing I really liked about Iron Man, which these guys have all heard, but um, it was that like I haven't seen this done since The Matrix. The trailers for it, like you saw Guy Pierce a little bit, but in in every like the Mandarin was always the head bad guy. Yeah, yeah, and that like that being a big facade was awesome. Yeah, that was. Awesome. I and really like um, yesterday, I just watched Star Trek, and the entire time you see like um, what's, what's his no, face? No spoil. That's not out. Yet. Like, that's, that's not, not out, out in the U.S. What's yet. his face? That guy. I, guy. Benedict Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. You see him as the main dude. He is the main dude. The most, but yeah, there's, no, there's, no, you, there's some crazy stuff with him. It's awesome. Benedict Cumberbatch, the most British name of all time, and he does. He is <laughs> fantastic in that movie. God damn, that movie's pretty good. Awesome. I, I, Can't wait. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, guess. Just, I just watched the last Star Trek movie again uh, last weekend. Yeah, I, to, to yep. right. my dad I, and I were going to go see see that because we went to go see The Hobbit together, and they had right. you know an IMAX. They had the the Star Trek Into Darkness preview. Yeah, the first ten and, minutes or whatever. Yeah, and he was yeah. like, "Man, that looks really good. I should probably see the first one." And I was like, "Wait, what?" Because him growing up, he was a big Star Trek fan. I'm like, "You have not seen the first one," <laughs> so we had to watch that recently. Oh man. No, it's, for me, the first Star Trek movie, I felt like the first 10 minutes were like some one of the best openings to a movie I've seen, like ever. Because the whole, like, if you don't remember, it was um, 
the father Kirk, so the older Kirk, yeah, Tiberius, I forgot, I think is his name, right? Um, he's oh, sitting there, yeah. and it, he sacrifices the ship and himself to save the guys, like his crew. That was so good, and that guy went on to become Thor, and that's pretty cool too. So yeah, yeah. And, and more really... importantly, the uh, motorcycle guy from Cabin in the Woods. <laughs> is he? <laughs> no way. Yeah. Ah. Oh. Man. Oh, that was my favorite movie that year. It came out, two thousand eleven. Oh, oh, Kevin such... the Woods was so good. Yeah, Kevin was a Thor. I seen it. Which are we talking about now? Oh God, a Kevin in the Woods. What? Wasn't that years ago? Let me have a look. Kevin no, was... that's what, relative. Was Maybe in Australia, where you get we get oh, movies late here in the US. You have to remember this. No, it was two thousand eleven. The... Okay. Yeah, that sounds right. Here's the thing, that was a 2011 was a couple years ago, which is kind of crazy when you stop and think about it. Yeah, that, that feels is. like forever ago. Yeah, I think it came out almost exactly two years ago. It was an early spring release. Hmm. Or mid, what are we now? At least we're technically late spring. Right. Early it's summer? Late spring? Yeah. No, it's not June yet. I don't, I don't know how it is for you guys in Seattle, but Portland, it feels like it's getting near summer. <laughs> yeah, actually, they, they it's are. It's hot. The Super Adventure Box team had a little reunion uh, picnic where we went out to the park and played frisbee and stuff. It was nice. Aww. Oh, Thurb, um, I, can just, I cannot express my disappointment enough that you live in Portland and you have yet to go to a Portland Timbers match. Sorry, I don't go to sports games. <laughs> oh, it seems like so much fun. Like, they score and they just set off green smoke and start revving up chainsaws because why not? I will go to a Portland Timbers game. Okay. <laughs> Liar. Um, this is no, one of the, the. This is a really true, great poster. If you hear a strange noise, sound outside, dot dot dot, have sex, cabin in the woods. It's the best. I, that, <laughs> wait, this. So this is like one of those horror spoof movies, right? Uh, no, I mean <laughs> it's a. It's a. It's not like a joke movie, but it it kind of turns the horror stuff on its. So it's like, I, I don't know. It's. Because okay, let's put it this way. I don't like horror movies because I don't really like horror anything. Well, I still enjoy this movie. Yes, because it, it goes exactly directions. Like I don't like horror movies, but this was just so. It, it's more like the best uh, episode of the X Files that has ever been made. Oh, yeah, like you, you okay. literally right, cannot right guess how, where this movie is going to go. Okay, because like I, I am not a big fan of like your traditional slasher horror movie, like at all. It, it oh yeah, no, this is not that right. And it 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 puts it in a kind of a sci fi wrapper, like an explanation why those tropes exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you have to see it. Because yeah. is that is that it's like correct me if I'm wrong, but like in the tra- in a trailer at least there was like some extra room with like what looked like a whole bunch of government people or some crazy nonsense, but they yeah. flashed it for like a second. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 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 that's not even like a twist that's established at the very beginning. Yeah, that's what I mean. Because <laughs> because it's, it's in the trailer, so if like that's in the trailer and it goes crazier from there, or at least not because that's not necessarily crazy, but it is different. Mm-hmm. Man, so it seems interesting. This is, this is kind of cool. Yeah, like, I might check this out. It's like just about every time you you think you understand what's going on, the the movie just goes a completely different direction. Yeah, and at the end, it's so off the wall and just, yeah. it's, it's insanity, but the best kind. Awesome. Okay, uh, Josh, do you plan on going to Pax Prime this year? Uh, I'm or sure. uh, I mean, like either as Arena Net or just as uh, I mean, it's an awesome convention that's in your town. Are you? Yeah, not as arena net. Um, it it depends on if my friends are going or not. I'm not sure where I, what I'm going to be doing. I'm probably going to be crunching on something really important. So, <laughs> okay. I just like that's the next time I'll probably be up in town in Seattle. So, uh, well, you should swing by the office again, and this time uh, make sure it's when I'm here, <laughs> and not at the meeting. Okay. There's actually a. <laughs> I'm, get your shit I remember together, you mentioned thing. that you have a wall of like art, like of various art books and just reference material in your kitchen or study or something. Yeah. Um, actually, let me let me grab the. Yeah, why did, why do you know this? Have you been he said it on the last podcast. Because <laughs> okay. all, all I know is that I went to PAX East and they had a whole bunch of art prints and there was a Guild Wars two on it. and I was like, hey, I play that video game. <laughs> nice. Do you really? I do. I'm like some people on this podcast. Burn. Oh, the right. therp, he got you. What's up? <laughs> I had the headphones off. No, it, it's cool. There was also it's one for you. Journey. Um, and I love all things Journey. Man. Journey Both band great. and game. Uh, have you heard of Jim Thornburg? Uh, he's a photographer of rock climbers and just general landscape scenery. No. All right. There, there's a book that's pretty – it's like it's just a bunch of rock climbers – climbing but it's in all sorts of areas that are 
uh, like similar to the discussion you we we had after the first podcast about just rocks and how like you guys have done. Yeah, awesome you guys job. talking about exciting things like rocks. <laughs> no, dude, rock climbing is fucking insane. Oh rock yeah, it is. Pretty insane. Nice. Rock climbing. Is- okay, but more just like how rocks are actually this like whole thing and not just brown. Yeah, and, right. Uh, he. he uh, you, you can. Well, I, I have a I have a, a design document of a game I will make at some point in my career that's going to be a <laughs> rock climbing uh, like race game. Will it have Oculus Rift support? Really wacky characters, but yeah, where I can just focus on making super legit, weathered, properly real mineral rock walls, and that'll be great. Hey, hey Duren, if we can somehow finagle DM controls into that, I think we might have something. What? <laughs> I, I don't know. They're what you, referencing what, something. What just happened? 